Hello and welcome to the Outcast. I'm your host HC, and with me is Wolf. And today we are going to start a new marathon, focusing on one of my favorite shows <laughs> from the last decade, maybe even one of my favorite shows in general. This is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Nickelodeon 2012 version, not mm-hmm. Rise of the TMNT, the one that's airing now, the CG one, which aired from 2012 until uh, 2017. So, um, uh, just to let you guys know, because uh, I I watched this show since it first aired, and all the way until its ending, I didn't miss an episode. While for Wolf, this is all going to be like a blind experience. Like he's Mostly, going to every. I saw a few episodes when it first started airing, but it didn't seem like I, I never really got completely interested so i never really finished or watched any major part of it so mostly yeah this would be fairly blind for me so yeah but uh today we are obviously starting with season one uh, of the show finally here to cover it yeah he thought the wait for ruby was long i am so excited about this wait for this has been much longer for h on hc's part i've put him off on this one for a while and i have a feeling (laughs) that he's trying to you know, get payback on me because of uh, how long I used to take with Ruby. I don't know what you're I talking about. Of course you don't. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, since this is the, uh, talking about the first uh, season, um, I do want to ask you, when was the first time you heard about this show? Like, uh, what is your history with Ninja Turtles in general? Ninja Just Turtles in general? I've watched... My history, I've never really gotten it. I never really got into any of the comic books, never read any of them. So I can't say I have a lot of knowledge on the comic book side of things. I think my first intro to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was, and this is probably going to make a lot of people either very sad or very happy. We'll see. But my first intro to TMNT was the old live action movies. The old, old live action movies. That was my first intro to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. like from 1990 yes those yeah Uh, uh, dude this movie is great (laughs) they're not exactly true to the canon i think but Uh, i like them they were fun uh, they were dumb 90s movies uh, like uh, i'll tell you this much the first movie is probably the most accurate of an adaptation Hmm. uh you know of a comic book to this day i love you but not the second and third (laughs) <laughs> um the second the second you know kind of keeps it you know it does continue the story in its own way it mm. doesn't really it doesn't really it, because you can tell what the second ones they kind of try to go more for the show the original cartoon mm-hmm. the third one we don't talk about yeah, that fair enough but yeah i remember and t- watching and all three TM- of those and that was my first intro to tmnt okay and you know ever since then like um uh, what uh, what else was on your plate regarding the franchise or is this um, it those movies like i said i've seen a few episodes of this show of the 2012 nickelodeon tmnt when it first started airing and i think that was like in terms of you know like it was from the 90s movies that i saw like in the 90s early 2000s somewhere like late 90s i think i saw them and then it was just nothing TMNT wise until this show came out and I watched a couple episodes of it here and there. And then it's just been nothing okay. since then. Like, I don't have a ton of experience with the Turtles. Okay, so I'm the opposite. I love yeah. the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> okay, we I never but knew. I will... Yeah. Wow. But uh, I'll, I will say this that, you know, my first exposure to the Turtles was the original 87 cartoon back when uh, i was born in the middle of its run which it just goes to show for how long i saw a few episodes of that as well but i can't most likely because um, but um, i grew up watching that show Mm. and i never really got into the comics because comic books are not really popular here and also it was probably too violent for my mother to allow me to pick it up but um you know, so I watched the 87 ca- cartoon a lot, and but I never really saw the live-action movies that were there at the time. I did watch that live-action show they had. That was an experience to 
look to look back at it. So I've it's heard. Like, it, it, it's 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 kind of like the room of the Ninja Turtles. It's Oof. so bad, it's good. <laughs> but uh, then and then I kind of had a falling out with the turtles. Like I kind of skipped the 2003 cartoon, even though I know it's good. I've seen a few episodes of that, and I know it's uh, great. I saw. But actually, what got me back into the turtles was the crossover they had with the 2003 cartoon and the 87 one. That was that was what brought me back. I that was I was in high school at the time, so it was like that point where nostalgia starts talking to you, and you are starting to get interested in your past. So uh, that kind of brought me back, and then this show came out, and I love it. And let's not talk about and let's not mention Michael Bay's name in this episode after this. You mean the best version of the turtles? Fuck you. <laughs> That's <all. laughs> but uh, anyway, so we are going to to cover the 2012 version because that's personally that's the version I like the most and and like uh, just uh, going over the first season. No spoilers yet. If for some reason you haven't seen this show and you're interested, then. I think it's a good first season. Uh, obviously, it got me hooked from the first episode, and the, but uh, you know, looking back at the rest of the series, you can tell that there's a lot of setup in this one—a good setup and a fun setup. But compared to stuff that happened in the later seasons, this is not not a weak season. But you can t- again, you can tell that they are starting to get to get out their footing instead of being like, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a start, but it's a good start. Mm-hmm. What do you think? As you know, you just want the season. What what are your thoughts? Um, so, <clears throat> I, I I'll say I'm not based on the first season. I'm not invested in it yet, right? Like I I didn't hate it. I enjoyed my time with it. I'm interested to see where they go, but I'm not invested in it. And for me, there is a difference between those two things. Having my interest and having my investment is very much, for me, if I'm invested, I'm going to be paying a lot closer attention to the show. I'm way into the characters, the world, the story, and what's going on there. If I'm interested, for me, I'm probably, there's things about it that I enjoy, but I'm not fully into it yet. Like, the world may not have grasped me yet, or the characters haven't really, you know, made me care a lot for them yet. Things of that nature. And, and just as an example, right? You know, we've talked about Ruby on the show before, and I absolutely did, and I absolutely adore and love Ruby. But Ruby yeah. didn't catch my. But Ruby really didn't get me invested until certain episodes in season in volume two, and especially volume three and onwards. That's when my investment really kicked in for Ruby personally. Mm-hmm. I think uh, the same would happen in this show. That's what I'm I think. thinking might happen as well. Like as we get into later seasons, I might grow way more invested. But yeah, that's not a bad thing though. Like you know, your first season. It's very rare, I think, for most people to really get invested into a show in the first season. It has happened for me as well. Like, I think Dragon Prince because, did yeah. that fairly well as an example. Like, I'm invested in Dragon Prince based on its first season, but I wasn't super invested. But I, I, I was more invested than I normally was because they, they just did it all really well. But this one, like, I'm interested. I enjoyed my time with it. It wasn't perfect. I don't feel there's definitely I think complaints I would level at it and we'll get into those soon enough yeah but overall a good first season that I think is definitely as you said a lot of setup for future stuff Mm -hmm. I will say this though like um you know going into this as a long as a long time fan um I think what makes this what makes the season this isn't stuck out to me and the entire show is that they kind of managed to get every uh, like uh, a bit of uh, you know some elements from the old cartoons, some elements from the 2003 cartoon, some elements from the comics, some elements from the movies, and and yet while while combining all of those, they still managed to throw uh, to throw in their own take on the on the well, battle. Yeah, this so, isn't spoilers. Uh, the art style in this is very reminiscent of the comics, is it not? Like the background art. Mm-hmm is very kind of it I, to me it felt like the background art yeah. a lot of your like city landscape shots were very much trying to invoke a comic book style art style was it not 
Yeah, and th there are actually a few shots, uh, you know, not a spoiler, but the very last shot of, of the opening is, is like the turtles posing in the exact same pose as they do for the original comic book yeah. cover. Yep. And they have a few more moments like this in the show. Yeah. You know, I, I'll be honest, I wasn't as fond of the art style in this show. Hmm. The art style, the comic book kind of, the, the the comic book reminiscent art style in this really didn't sell me on it as much. It's not bad by any means. It's just I didn't personally like it as much. Okay. It's very dark. It's very muted in tone, and very little stands out <clears throat> as like you know, as far as scenery goes, like. A lot of the scenery you'll be seeing this is kind of dark, muted colors, and it really. Didn't uh, you can. Uh, this is this is something that uh, may or may not uh, like. This is something you, you may or may not uh, say gets better as the show goes on because I we'll think see. in the anime, like the CG in general, you, uh, sometimes feel a bit staticky when it's not a fight <laughs> scene, and okay. this is something that, that got. The, and that's something that's got better in the okay. future seasons. Maybe maybe they just, you know, uh, this was like the, they got their feet wet or they didn't have well, as big of a budget. I yeah, don't know. I would but, probably uh, say budget since first season. They probably had a limited budget to work with since first season. And I think 2012, TMNT wasn't exactly popular anymore as, it, as popular anymore as it used to be back in the 90s. Um, no, it actually, uh, it, it does have, you know, it lasted five seasons, which well, is a lot what for I mean is like these days. The big uh, height of TMNT was in the 90s, more or less, and then it kind of died yeah, down for I mean, a bit. I think yeah, but, uh, it came back but still, because of this show in some ways, right? If I'm not mistaken, it's popularity-wise. Could be, be, because I can't, because I know the 2003 one was really popular. When because it, it wasn't but, until although after I this did, show that the Michael Bay movie became a thing, right? It was during the run. Yeah. And and this is something I, it kind of jumping ahead in season two, I have something to say about this. But <laughs> season two, when we get to season two. Fair but, enough. Because, but uh, so far, so we both agree, like, Good first season, yeah. but um, but but uh, you know you need you need a bit more to sell you on it. Well, Not I, invested, I, but I'm interested to see where it goes. Definitely fun, okay. definitely enjoyable. Not perfect, one, uh, but what is one last thing? One last thing, non spoiler that I'll say about uh, this show that I I think this is the first show where they actually you know kind of, earlier adaptations kind of kind of did this, kind of didn't do this where the turtles actually you can tell them apart aside from the color of their bandanas mm -hmm. and i I, th I really like the designs of the turtles in this show personally yeah i'd agree mm -hmm. so with that said let's uh, start episode by episode we have 20 seconds to go over mm -hmm. so yeah let's spoilers uh, let from yeah, here spoilers on if you haven't seen the show and you're interested, then spoilers, do not watch. You've been warned. Still here? Good. So we are about to... Let's uh, let's start with the first uh, the first episode, which is a two-parter, so... Yeah, I, so I will the first say two this, episodes. Uh, yeah, man, I will say that, uh, like, uh, two-parters, we are covering at the same time. We are covering... We are treating them as one long episode. Yeah. So... With that said, Rise of the Turtles. This was the big premiere, and so you have uh, to one... enlighten me. The Krangs normally not introduced this early on, are they? Um, From what I'll I understand of the much. Turtles, generally the Krang tend to be introduced much later on. Um, here's the thing: there are three adaptations of the Turtles where Krang this is, is a true. Thing. Uh, and so there's the 97 cartoon, 87 cartoon, where he's introduced in the second episode. There's the oh, Mike Bay versions, where he's introduced <laughs> in, the se in the second movie, and he sounds like the love child of Scooby Doo and the plant from Little Shop of Horrors. But, and then I like that version this show. already. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> just no. <laughs> and then there's this version where we're introduced to them from the start. But uh, aside from that, there's like uh, there isn't uh, necessarily a rule they didn't follow regarding Krang. Okay. Aside no, aside from something we'll get to later. But okay. uh, you know, but the first uh, thing we are introduced to are the turtles training with each other. And something I'm going to do is that whenever there's a no, the voice cast in this show is magnificent, and I'm going to give them all a shout out yeah. as, to the to the best I can. With that said, we it, the first title we hear is Greg Sipes as Michelangelo. People. Yeah. <laughs> What do you have to say about my turtle? Pit it out. I didn't. Greg Sipes, if I'm, that's his name, correct? Yeah, Greg Sipes. He's a the, great VA. But, he's a really just wonderful so people VA. Know the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, to the people who want to know, he's the voice of Beast Boy in both teen, in the original Teen Titans cartoon and Teen, teen Titans Go. He's He voiced this character for 15 years. And that's where we get into this. I really disliked Beast Boy in Teen Titans. Like, I didn't hate him. It he it took him a while to grow on me then. But I've never really been a big fan of Greg Sipes's voice for that character, and you that he uses a very similar, if not the exact same voice, almost for Michelangelo in this. Show. It's the same. It's the same voice. And you can tell it's him. I've never been fond of the voice personally. This particular voice, at least, anyways, or the comedy that he kind of tends to bring. It's never clicked with me. It's never been a thing that I've really been like, ha ha, this is funny. I like this. It's kind of been, yeah, this is, I've seen this before. Yay, funny, ha ha, funny. Nah, it's, no, it just doesn't work. It just personally, it doesn't work for me. And I honestly find it annoying. And Mikey and the, sh Michelangelo in the show, or Mikey, I found him annoying for the most part. Maybe that'll change as we go on. Beast Boy did grow on me in, in Teen Titans, but that was only when he only tended to grow on me when he was actually being serious and not the stupid funny he was generally tended to be. That's why I really, really hated Teen Titans Go, but anyways. <clears throat> well, Teen Titans Go is just terrible unless you're talking about the movie. That's really the best way I can describe uh. that show. But yeah, like Greg Sipes, great VA, wonderful work, does a lot of amazing work, but his work for Beast Boy and his work for Michelangelo, while good, it took me a while to get into Beast Boy. I I hope that's going to be the same with Michelangelo, but again, as I said, Beast Boy, I really only got into when they did the more serious moments with his character, because mm -hmm. that was more well, interesting to me. Hopefully that becomes well, the same for Michelangelo, but... The comedy think, is just uh, not my thing. You'll, fi you'll find something to like, I think. We'll but uh, it, as someone who Michelangelo was his favorite tunnel, so Greg Sipes' version that is... That explains so much. Yeah, I think. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but I do like Greg Sipes uh, in the role. I, yeah, I'll even good. argue... I'll even argue he's the best Michelangelo because, you know, he's the one that sounds the less surfer dude... Which I like, yeah. Um, but so I'll give him that. And then we also, uh, regarding the other turtles, we have Jason Biggs, uh, who people may know as Jim Lev Levenstein from American Pie, and Larry from Orange is the, in Orange is the New Black. He's the voice of Leonardo. Mm -hmm. A good pick. And again, yeah, and again, you can tell that these guys don't really change their voices, but it no. works. Yeah, it works for the characters. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, as Raphael, we have Sean Astin, who played someone in Lord of the Rings. I'm not a fan of Lord of the Rings, so I can tell you the name. Uh, let's see. Uh, Samwise Gamgee. Gamgee. Samwise Gamgee. But anyways, Jesus. Okay. You don't, you're going <laughs> yeah, to really, uh, shortchange the lovely well, man that is Sean Astin. Like, Jesus. Well, I will tell you that he's the best Raphael, so... Yeah. Fair enough. And uh, he also played um, he also played Mikey in Goonies. These are and also hey, let, 
Let you me do tell realize you. that, um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, should uh, mention he was also in Stranger Things as well recently. Yeah, he he was Bob in Stranger Things. Yes, you're right. Yeah, you, know, you got to give you know Bob the yeah, hero right. some credit, yo. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because you know, we, but uh, I'm not sure how many people who are listening to this have seen Stranger Things, so I've went with everyone's seen Stranger the, Things. But if you haven't, most watch likely it because it's great, you're missing out. You heard it, mom, but anyway. <laughs> and, le and lastly, uh, in the role of Donatello, we have Rob Paulson, who's done way more, vo way more voice work than we can bring mention to. But uh, among uh, favorites, Yako Warner in Animaniacs, uh, Carl Weezer in, in Jimmy Neutron, and of course, the original Raphael in the 87 culture. That must have been weird to go from Raphael to Donatello. Um, he did say that he does feel extremely lucky that, you know, he got to play another turtle all these years later. Because when he was picked for Raphael, he, people didn't know who, what this was. And now he can go back to this when everybody knows who the Ninja Turtles are. And he's like, so, and honestly, I prefer him as Donatello. Yeah, he was really good in that role, I think. And so, and apparently, whenever in the first few sessions, whenever the end attack, Sean asked him would always look up to him and ask him, "Am I doing this right? Am I serving your legacy?" So there you go. That's an interesting behind the scenes trivia. And we're also introduced to Master Splinter, voiced by Hoon Lee, who people may know as the King from The King and I on Broadway. Master Splinter was my favorite in this, I think, by far. Well, well it's Splinter. Second or, it's third, a... second or third favorite. Because Splinter is awesome. Mm -hmm. And so we are starting the, um, for the first two part of Rise of the Turtles with the Turtles training. And we and this is like a quick way to introduce them. You know, Michelangelo has the nunchucks. Leonardo is using katanas. Raphael has the sigh. And Donatello uses the bow staff. Mm -hmm. And you can also kind of see their personality that Michelangelo is the goof off, Leonardo is the silent, is the silent one, you know, quiet water go deep, as they say. Uh, Raphael is the mean older brother, and Donatello is the smart, geeky one. Mm -hmm. And then we have Splinter, who is their, also, for one, their sensei, and also their father. Mm -hmm. This is the. And we are quickly thrown into the backstory of the Turtles as they're celebrating their 15th birthday. And uh, to the people who grew up with the comic or any version of the Turtles that's not the 87 cartoon, they might know that Splinter was the pet rat of a ninja master named Hamato Yoshi. In this show, what they did is they took the 87 version where he is a Hamato Yoshi who was mutated into a rat. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Like, that's not quite right, is it? And it's not. So I was right. You know, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's fine. It's not. A, I don't think there's a problem with that. It's a different take, and I think that's perfectly fine. Honestly. I'll tell you this much. I'll tell you this much. In the '87 cartoon, they changed it because you know they didn't want to involve deaths in a cartoon aimed at kids. Mm. But in here, they not actually use this. They, they use this in interesting ways that we'll get to yeah. as we move along. Because like, they actually tie it into the story and a few plot elements, which I appreciate. And also, personally, even though we are talking about turtles well, that are fighting using ninjutsu, I think that it's a bit, even for that idea, it's a bit far-fetched for me that a rat could learn ninjutsu from a human by just copying it. So making the ninja master turn into a rat is probably a more quote unquote logical way to go at it. You're just being cruel, but, rats. You, you rat <laughs> racist. You're but racist I will say this. Rats. But I will say this. I will buy that a rat can learn ninjutsu from copying a human. Way more than I can believe that uh, a rat can learn ninjutsu from a freaking book, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, so in this version, uh, 
Splinter is Hamato Yoshi, and we'll get uh, we'll get more into this later. But one day he bought four pet turtles from the pet shop. He came across um, a few hostile people who attacked him, and the ca- and they carried around the can of what will we will know soon enough as the mutagen or the ooze, if you want, and. When that uh, breaks and spills, it uh, it turns the turtles a you you know human, uh, because the last thing they touched was another Yoshi, and it turns Yoshi into a rat because the last thing they touched was a rat that went you know that was around, and thus uh, he started training them in the art of ninjutsu until now where uh, they're fifteen. He kept them in secret in the in the sewers, and now for the first time ever they are about to head out into into the city. Mm-hmm. And as they do, we have run, eventually run across them running into the Krang, kidnapping April O'Neil and her, you know, a young April O'Neil and her father. That's a new one too, right? Normally April O'Neil yeah. is not a teenager herself in this one she is. Yeah, there. she is a teenager in this one and the, writer, the creator of the show explained this as, you know, why would an adult hang out with teenagers? This is fair. So, this is a fair yeah. explanation. Uh, and you know, when people ask me, uh, "How can you like this when April is a teenager?" It's like, yeah, uh, you know, something make her a teenager. It makes more sense that to be honest, hang out with teenagers. April, I think, is way cooler in this one, anyways. <laughs> if yeah. I'm honest, and and she's also voiced by. But Mae my Whitman, experience is who... very very limited. Also, yeah, Mae Whitman, and Mae Whitman is wonderful. Yeah, so... she's the voice of Katara in other. Starbender and us How to Join Dragon fans know her as Heather from Ways to the Edge and the TV show in general. May Whitman can so, do no wrong. This is fact. And meanwhile, the Krang, you know, the entire species, that's another difference that, you know, in the original cartoon, Krang was, you know, an alien that was based on, uh, on a race of aliens from the comics called the Utrams, but, you know, he was just by himself. This time we have an entire race named the Krang, who who is using bodies. You know, there are a bunch of little brain thingies that are actually us- using bodies in order to operate in the human world, which is kind of ingenious way to upgrade the idea that the original brain was like in. You know, it had this body that <laughs> that he was in the stomach of all places. So mm-hmm. they use that. There's an army of those, and the Krang are voiced by Nolan North, who again did way too many voice work in order to <laughs> bring all of it. But a few, no, a few notable roles are Nathan Drake in the Uncharted games, Deadpool in almost anything Deadpool related, and uh, Stuart replacing Gerald Butler in the Half Giant Dragon TV show. Mm-hmm. So with that said, the Tolls get into their first fight, trying to save April and her father from the crank. Um, your thoughts, because I'm kind of taking over. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Um, I enjoyed this for the most part. Like you know, I think it, it's you know good enough setup. It kind of go. It it doesn't spend a bunch of time on the backstory of the turtles, which even those who aren't super familiar with the turtles know already at this point, right? Yeah, like, it's kind of like the Spider-Man thing. We don't need to see Spider-Man. I was just we don't a, need to see Uncle Ben die again. It. We've seen it now enough that yeah, Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben dies. We know this. We don't need to see it again. Batman's parents are killed. We know. We don't need to see it again. We've seen it all so many times now at this point, in so many different iterations that we don't need to see it again. So I'm kind of glad that it's very quickly gone through. It's just a quick flashback thing, and I do enjoy the way the show does flashbacks in a in a very kind of I guess you'd say comic book style. Like they kind of take, yeah. and, and you'll see the show kind of lean into that comic book thing quite a few times and how it'll do some of its action, some of its action stuff where it'll take like and use comic book panels to show certain scenes in a certain neat way. I, I like how the show does that and uses that by the way, but I like the flashback scene. It was a cool way to show that. I love shows that kind of take and say, hey, here's our regular style. Let's switch to a completely different style when we do our flashbacks. I like shows that do that. I'm a sucker yeah. for that. But that was mm-hmm. fun. Again, it was very quickly going through. We're very quickly into the meat of things where we see April getting kidnapped. April and her father getting kidnapped. And we, 
see that Donnie falls immediately in love with April. Yeah, that's a that's a subplot for the entirety of the show. For and you know, I <clears throat> when I first heard that they're going to do this, I was a bit skeptical, but I to still be am. honest. <laughs> you you have information a... I don't. Don't spoil, but yeah, okay. I'll admit, as of right now, um, I still I will it. say that. Okay. Uh, so I'll say this, that for the most part, for like 95% of the show, it's just a joke. So it's not like they're actually building up a romance. You this is true. don't have to... Like this, that, that's uh, definitely the way they play it for the first season that they released anyways. It's mostly a joke. Mm-hmm. There are little cute so... moments, I suppose you could say, but it's mostly a joke. Yeah, um, so there's that. That's a subplot that you know, for Better Worlds is very popular online. Like that's a very popular ship in the fandom. I mean, but uh, Rule Thirty Four of everything exists, HC. Yeah, I didn't see Rule Thirty Four. Oh, okay. it exists. I'm <laughs> sure. I know. I know it exists, but I <laughs> but I didn't see it, and I'm not interested. Thank you very much. Uh, I know what I'm going thing, to be uh, looking for to show to share with you. No. Later. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Uh, the one thing I do like about this way, they, the Thomas go into action and the Splinter t- uh, touches upon this, that for years he trained he, he trained them to fight each turtle for, uh, for his own. And now, and so I do like the fact that they're not yet ready, like when they're trying to fight as a team, they're not, like they're not coordinated. There's no coordination between yeah. the two. The uh, first fight with the Krang is very much them doing quite poorly because they're trained individually not as a team so you can kind of see like the starting here the starting point here is like i I would say is we don't is less the backstory of the turtles and more just them forming as a team and we get to see a lot of how the different characters in the past shows and comics are created as the mutagen infects more people as well yeah, we we'll did skip that. this, but uh, we also see the first times I ever try out pizza. This is true. Which, by the way, this is another thing that they have these kind of vision. There's a lot of visual humor in this show, yeah. so I like when Mikey tastes tastes the pizza, and you can literally like there's only a zoom in on his brain mm-hmm. as it explodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and I think that was around the time that the term mind blown was starting to get popular. So, mm-hmm. you know, that that's a good, that's a thing. And another thing that you know, their first fight against the Krang, which doesn't go well, le- leads Splinter to believe that in order to f- function better as a unit, they need a leader because that's the first version of the Turtles where Leonardo. Is not the leader from the start, mm-hmm. and we actually get a justification to why the turtles are the leader. And and another thing that you know, I always felt in other versions that you know, I like Leonardo fine, he's not terrible or anything, but yeah, it always felt like the fact that he's the leader is there to make up for the fact that he's the straight man, therefore the most boring of the four. Well. So in this one, him trying to be a leader and growing into the role made it... I, I like that out, which is There's something, more, again... You, you kind of see it happen within the first season somewhat, but you can really see the personalities for each Turtles, for each one of the Turtles mm-hmm. grow over the, throughout the season. Like, mm-hmm. th- there's more than just... As of now, I would say the only one who didn't... Two, one character who I don't feel has shown any major character beyond what you normally know him as is Mikey. Again, maybe this will change yeah, in later because... seasons, but in this first season, he kind of he was he's always been the goofball and kind of stays the goofball. He has his moments, but overall remains the goofball. You can kind of see Raph as you know Raph is still the grumpy, uh, you know, angry one all the time. But you do see some growth there in the season. You see a lot of you see quite a bit of growth with Leonardo later on in the season, as mm-hmm. he grows in the term in terms of becoming a leader, things like that. And you see quite a bit. And, Donatello, you see some growth too as well, especially, and he also has something that you know kind of makes him different from what is normal, kind of the geeky nerd. Yeah, he's, is you the know, relationship he's the, And not only that, this Donatello is a lot uh, quippier. He's a lot more sarcastic, mm-hmm. which I love. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to some which of is my favorite. Donatello favorite. is best turtle, but anyways. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends. With him, so, yeah. But um, anyway, uh, so, so you know, 
after this failure, uh, I do like um, Michelangelo being my favorite. I do like the fact that he is trying to take on one of the Krang by himself. And, you know, and then he tries, and then when he sees that, you know, there's a brain in this thing's stomach, and, you know, the other, the other turtles obviously don't believe him, but I do like their reaction to it. That is like, that guy had a brain. It's like, we all have brains, not all of us. I don't know, I, you know, there's something, you know, I think people seem to forget that the turtles are brothers, mm-hmm. and they do act like brothers yeah. in this show. And, you know, not only bottles, they actually act like, get this, teenagers. This I know, mind-blowing. <laughs> but uh, they go back to the schools where uh, Splinter tells them, you know what, if you're going to be a better unit, you're going to need a leader. And Leonardo volunteers. To... And that's something I also like, that, they're, that there's a kind of a reason as to why Leonardo is the leader, which is something that, you know... Kind of jumping ahead in the episode, Splinter tells them it's because Leonardo was the first one who asked to be one. But well, later, as the to season be clear, goes right? on, like, Raphael said it. Sh- Raphael didn't ask; he just said it should be him. And I think Donnie kind of did something similar. And then Mikey made a joke about how it should be him, and everyone kind of stared at him like, yeah, "Yeah, no." Even Splinter did that too, which I found a little bit funny. But yeah, I did kind of like how Splinter's reasoning reasoning was: you asked. There was no other reason. You just, you asked, so that's why you're leader. I found that kind of funny. And Splinter, I think, has also has a lot of good lines where it's just really funny. Like in the beginning of this episode, you hear him kind of use the yes and no, yes mm-hmm. and no. And then he finally just says no. And but no. That's, no. I, like that's Splinter has a lot of good lines. Yeah, because that's the thing that uh, people of Splinter 4 and they captured it really well in this show. <laughs> Well, you know, he has all, he, like, you can tell that his hell, uh, the past hurts, but he also has very wise things to say. Like, you know, he says, I've lost a lot of things. Why? <laughs> As I think Why? Michelangelo very clearly states in a later episode, you know it's good advice when you're left even more confused after the advice. Yeah. But, you know, he <laughs> says to Leonardo, I lost a lot of stuff uh, in my past, but I, but that day where I lost uh, my wife and uh, my wife and daughter, I also gained a lot of things like the four of you, uh, and you know that's you know that's a wonderful lesson to teach, even if it's hard to follow. And mm-hmm. then, you know, and also another thing, we'll get more into this uh, as I say. Splinter actually acts like the turtle's father in this, which I really like, because you know. Uh, he's always been kind of their father, but in this, you know, he actually tells them when they're about to go above ground, he's telling them, like, use clean restrooms, or, you know, be careful about this, or, or as soon Don't as talk about to strangers. Out, you know, things yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. Little yeah. things that just really add to the character somewhat. I agree. It was nice to so, see. Him. The second half so of this now, episode, though, we've been really focused on the first half. The second half, yeah, the, we... Yeah. <clears throat> The turtles find out but, where the uh, O'Neills are being held and infiltrate their yeah, and infiltrate and the Krang that, hideout. And also, they learn that the Krang are related to the same to the same material, the same ooze mm-hmm. that um, when uh, that uh, mutated them, and everything kind of comes full circle. So they do approach, you know, they do plan like an attack on the Krang's uh, hideout. I do and, like how the first step. I'll admit. They got a chuckle out of me when they ended the first episode because apparently Mikey has this thing going on where he calls the mutagen tank mom. So yeah. I'll admit that it's... made me laugh how they ended on mom. <laughs> what? Yeah, when he goes That one mom? got me. <laughs> that one got me, I'll admit. That that was a good okay. joke. That one got me. Fair. Fair enough. Um, so, yeah, there was that. <clears throat> and then... Hold on a second. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, so there's this, and then they um, attend, they break into the Krang's hideout. Mm-hmm. Also, fa- also like there's um, this guy walking in, for, walking for the Krang who turns into a mutant planet name, which Michelangelo names Snakeweed, which is another running gag, which is Michelangelo naming all the mutants I come across. Well, I mean, and that, that's my favorite. My favorite comes in the later episode. Mm-hmm. These are all characters in the comics and stuff like that too, are they not? Um, Snakeweed, I don't think so. Ah, 
I, did, I wasn't sure. I don't like this character's design somewhat. Like, why they needed, why they felt the need to have his legs be like, hey, you can see the bone and the sinew and the muscle part. Blah. Why did they okay. need to do that and show that? Otherwise, it would be an okay character, but eh, they kept having the mm. list of shots of his legs where you can see the inside of his legs, and it's just weird. It's like, why is why are we seeing bone and all of that? Why can't you just make that part green like the rest of him? Just bleh to that. But anyways, you know. Uh, but um, big fight scene <laughs> as the to- big yeah big fight scene is going on as the turtles rescue April. Uh, her father is still being captured, but at least April herself is saved. Then they kind of. Um, they kind of, you know, put her in, under the gun, uh, under the care of an aunt, which we never see. Uh, no. But uh, there, but you know, that kind of, you know, builds that connection between the Turtles and April. To be fair, and... we don't see a lot of things. This is New York, and yet we still see in the same episode a, a truck crash in the middle of the street, and no one's around, no one says anything, and this is New York. <laughs> I'm gonna keep this is gonna be brought up a few times, I'll admit, because this is a problem I have. Like there are just a lot of things that happen in the city of New York where no mm-hmm. one's around. Well, you know, we don't really see the first first thing in the morning, so you know, someone probably talked about it at the point. Mm. So mm. Yeah, so yeah, all of this is happening, but the episode ends on a tease when you know the news do report about uh, about you know what what happened. They don't necessarily talk about turtles because nobody saw the turtles, but they do talk about some stuff that happened because of them. And when and watching this news and realizing that his old enemy is still alive is the Shredder of mm-hmm. Okosaki. Yeah, we're introduced to him quite like we're introduced to a lot yeah, of stuff very vo- early on, which uh, voiced wonderfully by Kevin, Kevin Michael Richardson, mm-hmm. which has a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of gold under his belt. Yeah. And I won't even attempt to find one to tell you who it is, but uh, yeah, he's a wonderful as the Shredder. I love his voice. Yes, he does great. Like, yeah, does mm-hmm. very wonderful with his character. But with that said, we are jumping into the next episode, Total Temple. Which yeah. is this is the, this is where they start kind of the total focused episode, and this is obviously the Raphael episode, which uh, but deals I'll with admit, this. Right, like we've gone through, like even though, like yeah, we kind of have to go through the turtles, kind of doing their own turtle specific episode, and Raph is the angry one. It never feels old, right? Like it never, mm-hmm. like it definitely. I think the season did. I think for me personally, I think 26 episodes might have been a bit too much. It did feel like it started to drag ever so slightly, but at the same time, it never felt like, okay, I've been like, I've been through this before, but it never felt so bad. Like I've, you know, there are some things like, okay, we've been through this before. Let's move on already. This one never felt that bad. Like I could definitely, I definitely had the feeling watching it where... Yeah, I've seen this before. Raph is the angry one. I get it. We got to work on his anger. But it, it it was still interesting enough. And I think that's because of how they kind of went about doing it. I and mean, we'll get into that with this episode where, you know, Raph's anger comes out when they get caught on video by a, you know, random New Yorker. Yeah. In high definition, as Winter points out. Yes. But yeah, this is this is again when we see Raphael's temper at full display, and he kind of learns to control it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's another thing. Again, when we see Splinter actually talks to him about it and teaches them like mm-hmm. how like how his anger can be can be both a strength and a weakness. And again, not only is it good on Splinter's part uh, as a parent and as a mentor, but it also, I can see, you know, parents, if your kid have short pe- temper, like my parents and me, use this. <laughs> this is great. And also, if I may, a uh, moment this episode that um, I loved it, it has nothing to do with Raphael. Um, we forgot to mention that there's kind of a tradition of a show with a show, 
which is inherits like a space heroes, which is a part ah, of yeah. Star Trek, yeah, which, that's Star which Trek Leonardo, Republic. yeah, which Leonardo loves. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and like that, when he's trying to be a leader, he he's in his reference is that show. So he's trying to be like all heroic by saying, "Prepare to dish out the mighty words of justice," and then Donatello is like, "Seriously, just you'll get him." Like, mm-hmm. yeah, that and, was kind again. Of- Again, sibling banter mm-hmm. in a show about brothers. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I love that. And of all, this is a, this is a kind of um, you know I, I will say about the um, you know the total specific episodes in this season that some of them are hit and miss. This one is a bit more hit, but you know I don't. It's not it's not an episode that I like. When you tell me to pick the series best. This not the one I'll, I'll recommend on top of my head. No, uh, I, I do like how you know, <clears throat> you know, we, we have our New Yorker whose name it is Vic. He gets abducted by the Krang. Be in the Krang want you know end up you know he tries to sell his footage of the turtles to the Krang as well, and the Krang don't really care, and they're just kind of using the footage to learn from it, and then eventually the turtles try and rescue. Vic and he's eventually turned into a mute, and he's eventually mutated himself as well. And yeah, his new he name gets mutated into spider bites. Yeah, a lot. Because thank you, Donnie. Because, because thank you, he is Z, yeah, because Z is cool. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, that's a you know, fine episode. Moving on to another well, I mean, specific yeah, episode. It, uh, the, the, the end of this episode results in like Rav coming in to save the day and learning to control his anger because like he had a back and forth with this particular New Yorker who was very very vitriolic, right? Like he's very toxic. You know the New Yorker banter, I guess you would say. Like you know, and you know I do. Uh, Rav have. Uh, a good line in this where the because this Vic guy always refers to them as Kung Fu and this is the first time like a kind of the roll credits moment as Cinema Sins puts it where he's like we're not Kung Fu frogs we're Ninja Turtles mm-hmm. you know it's one of those uh, it's so cheesy but at the same time I like it because it's cheesy I, I, I also assume this is right like this is kind of referencing some of the old parody stuff that came about thanks to the Ninja Turtles? Probably. Because there's a bunch of different parody stuff that came about you know, after the well, Ninja the Turtles inter- grew the popular. Inter- the, yeah, you know, there was Battletoads and stuff, so I can see how, like, uh, somebody like said, you know what, uh, frogs don't do Kung Fu, and Kung Fu is like Ninjitsu, because martial arts, so yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's roll with this. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, like you know, overall, a, a fairly decent, you know, Raphael focused episode on his anger and him learning to control his anger. Although yeah. still, even after this, being fairly angry most of the time. So mm-hmm. <laughs> not sure what lesson yeah, it, was learned. <clears throat> uh, we'll see. Uh, but uh, <laughs> next uh, next episode is new friend old enemy. This is the Michelangelo centric episode, which mm-hmm. is well, you want to know why Michelangelo. Favorite because he's the friendliest, and all he wants is for to be friends with the humans. But the humans are stupid, racist assholes who can't accept the fact that they're granted. I would probably scream if I see a giant turtle talking to me. But if he tries to hunt my cat, I will, you know, what? I will give him the benefit of a doubt. To be honest, this kind of exemplifies why I find Mikey annoying. This does this episode does not do him any favors. Okay. I think the more interesting part of this episode is the Chuck Norris lookalike, who is apparently yeah. Chris a famous, a famous martial artist who is apparently Shredder's most promising pupil. Or yeah, was. So uh, th- this is Chris Bradford, um, voiced by Clancy Brown, which people may know as Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob and Lex Luthor in the DC animated universe. But uh, he's, you know, he, and again, this is something that we'll get, that we'll probably see in the future seasons, but he's like a celebrity, a martial arts celebrity who works for the Shredder. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's one of his top uh, pupils. 
and Mikey is a fan of them, and he actually starts befriending him, befriending him, and everything. And the, this is one thing I really like about this episode that, uh, like, uh, Bradford Cho teaches Mikey a technique called the Death Red Dragon, and when you know he shows it to the other turtles, and the turtles actually practice it, and when Splinter sees it, he automatically flashes back to to one of his fights with the Shredder, and he's like, where did you learn that? You know, that's, uh, I, you know, I really like this. Yeah, it's a nice little that, connecting factor thing. Mm-hmm. That, you know, you could say that it's like a plot MacGuffin, but at the same time, it, it's plot MacGuffin that works. Mm-hmm. It's... Uh, but yeah, another episode that's fine. I li- I like that I like that episode and uh, and everything. But you know, there are better Mikey episodes in the future on the show. So this we will is not. See. This is definitely not one that sold me. I think this one, the the only takeaway for that Mikey wasn't really a takeaway for me here. It was mostly Zever, the other villain we were introduced to in this episode, another pupil. Zever. Yeah, another pupil of Shredder. And like I said, Chris Bradford and Chris Bradford and Zever, I think, were the big selling points of this episode. Not so much Mikey. Okay, and that's fair. But yeah, we end up in a fight between those two and the turtles. The turtles win, and that's pretty much it. And then, like you know, Mikey unfriends Chris Bradford. Yeah. Uh, By the way, I do. This is uh, one of uh, April's first appearances, the show premiere, and I, I I like that. When she tells Mikey, Mikey, you already have a human friend, me. Oh, yeah. And, he's like, April, and it's like, April, you don't count. We saved you. <laughs> you have to like us. <laughs> and another thing I like that, that Donnie's screen, you know, desktop uh, picture is April about to eat a pizza. <laughs> you know, I, I know that it's kind of a typical, you know, the, the gig guy has a... Um, has a picture of his crush on it, but really, that's the best picture you could get of her eating a pizza. I mean, it's two of his <laughs> best loves, pizza and April. So, fair enough. Mm, I will say that he loves science more than pizza, but sure. Have you seen? The, says the fan of the turtles, the bigger fan of the turtles. I disagree yeah. on that, but anyways. Well, um, next episode is, I think his name is Baxter Stockman. And yes, Baxter Stockman is a character from the the original comic. That is is the name of the episode, by the way. That's not H.C. saying, I think. No, the name of the episode is. No, no, that's the name of the episode. Yeah, that's a a funny episode name. I like this one because it plays on the idea that no one gets Baxter Stockman's name right. Ever. Mm -hmm. That's just a running gag whenever Baxter Stockman is in an episode. But yeah, this one's fun. We get you know a little bit of Mikey, of a little bit of Donatello being the nerdy one because he invents a music player using a military intelligence chip that he found in the garbage. Um, but uh, and uh, something about uh, Bexel Stockman, uh, uh, voiced by Phil Lamar, which people may know as the Green Lantern in the Justice League animated shows. A lot of DC people appearing in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, there are a few Marvel ones, but uh, yeah. Anyway, um, be- before we start anything about the episode itself, this is technically the first introduction of the Kawabanga replacement for this show, Booyakasha. Blah. I, I thought this the... good. I I agreed with you when I initially heard about this because I thought uh, that I th- because I thought oh I don't have manga was way... no I it's not because I have an attachment to the old one I hate both phrases oh I hate both oh. phrases equally <laughs> neither <laughs> phrase has neither phrase has really gotten me right like I don't care for either phrase but anyways I also like I dislike the whole. Let's have our VAs, because they're ninjas, do the hua thing in the background all the time whenever they're fighting. That also got an, on my nerves so much. <laughs> that was so annoying. That continues to be an annoying factor, and it will never not be an annoying, uh, I'm sure. Oh my god, Wolf, you're out to please. <laughs> but, I'm an old man. Anyway, this is why I like Splinter. He's a curmudgeonly old man, too. Yeah, And he so, has to lead anyway, a bunch of disobedient kids. Yeah, we'll I get relate to this to because him. this episode, 
this episode really touches upon this. That, uh, uh, but uh, you know, this is the first introduction of Booyakasha, and I had some reservations against it when I first heard about this. But you know what? I, I, and I know you're going to hate me even more than you usually do. Yeah. But, but. I really grew fond of this catchphrase to the point that I actually start saying it in real life without even noticing. But that's another story. God, you cringy fuck. I know. <laughs> I know. I, to be fair, the character sells it well, right? Like, uh, yeah, si- yeah, the, the VA for Michelangelo Greg sells Sipes. it. Yeah, Greg Sipes. I'm going to forget He's his name again. He's the one that came up with it. Yeah, like, he sells it really well. He sells the line really well. Like I'll give him credit. Like I don't really care for the line. I don't. I didn't care for Kawabunga in the past either. But Greg Sipe sells the line really well whenever he does use it. And it's not something that he says all the time. It's very. It's he uses yeah. it in like he he uses it sparingly, which is good. Mm-hmm. If yeah. he used it um, all the time, I think I would shoot myself. Yeah, he uses the. You know he have to become a catchphrase but at the same time we also you know it is there is usually a good gap mm-hmm. between each time he says it yeah okay so in this like you said this is the first episode where we really actually sprinted as a father because he grounds the turtles after messing around in the lair mm-hmm. and and we also see the first uh, sign of you know teenage rebellion as you know Raphael decides you know what I can't take this anymore. I'm out. And Leonardo actually tells them. Well, and this is another thing I like that, you know, Raph's impersonation of Splinter. Like, I do not know about any of this because I was asleep. I don't know. I, I Again, teenagers. Yeah. In, yeah, in a show about teen- yeah, I like it. But I also like that Leo kind of convinces himself to go with them that he's like, well, as your leader, I should probably go with you in order to make sure you don't get into trouble. So, you know, he, he knows it's wrong, but he's fine, which I like. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and another uh, good, uh, he said that Don, I like Daniel's sarcasm in this. So when he makes the, the you know, the music player, the teapot, mm-hmm. um, so, um, would later be known as the T phone, but we'll get to that when we get to, we get to that. Um, so and uh, Raph, uh, Raph actually asks him when he gives that thing to Mikey for test. He tells him like, uh, "You're going to plug a charge into Michelangelo's head. What if it melts his brain?" He's like, um, uh, "It won't. And even if it did, who would know any? Who would notice the difference?" Yep. <laughs> Poor Mikey and his no brain. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know they go out, they, they have fun, and then they meet this Bexel Stockman guy, who causes trouble. So, so but he's know, also they... kind of a mediocre villain at first. Like his battle suit barely functions, and all these different mm-hmm. things. But he's introduced to this military AI, which basically makes it you know because Mikey loses the teapod, so Baxter mm-hmm. gets a hold of it, and that makes his suit way better. And so now because of their mess up right we have a much greater and much stronger villain and i think if i'm not mistaken it <clears throat> that's kind of the basis for this episode and that's kind of why splendor grounds them as well is because like hey what you he do notices, can... he notices he notices that they you know left at night without without his permission and he does teaches them that you know they have to take responsibility for the stuff they cause. Mm-hmm. And, and also that, you know, hey, like the screw ups you, you make can result in even greater problems later on. So, you know, and that's something we'll kind of get back to in another later episode as well. But I like yeah, this is a great introduction for Baxter Stockman, who does become a recurring villain later on and somewhat more important later on as well. And like, it's it's fun. This is a good episode overall. Like, yeah. Nothing major to write home about it's not focused on the turtles it's kind of it's not focused on one specific turtle it's focused on all of them kind of learning a lesson this yeah, is which of... is not a bad thing which is no, not no, a bad thing at all. all like this is actually um, a, this is one of the better episodes i think in the beginning kind of couple ones yeah and again splinter being a father who beats his kids is it's pretty funny i admit when especially how the episode tells them i'm uh, you know the name of what is going to do to them, and the episode cuts as soon as they start to run away. 
I like it. Yeah. It's fun. Um, okay, so next episode is Metalhead. People, <laughs> people familiar with the Turtles know that Metalhead is a robotic counterpart to the Turtles, who is usually an enemy. But in this show, he's a creation of Donatello, who, who becomes an enemy. <laughs> yeah, who becomes an enemy. But, uh, you know, later on, they do use him a friend so that's oh yeah sure like he, he's still he just becomes an enemy for a time because the crane end up controlling him this isn't mm -hmm. an episode that really stuck out to me too much i'll be honest it's kind yeah, of, I, of I, do, I do like one thing about it that uh, you know when people look at the total's weaponry everyone kind of brings up that you know um leonardo has the katanas Raphael has the sai michelangelo has the nunchucks and Donatello gets stuck with a bow staff, which people always were like, why, you know, isn't he kind of, you know, didn't he kind of get the short end of the stick but not intended? So, you know, I do like that there's an episode with them actually dealing with the fact that he is, you know, he just has a staff and he needs to learn how to appreciate it. But he also tries to say, you know what, maybe I should use my mind to create metalhead. And that backfires completely. I mean, the show does show off many times where his staff just gets absolutely broken consistently mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. So I'm sure, like, they're mm -hmm. going to do a thing later where he makes creates a metal staff. And it's like, why? That's that's something that we forgot to talk about to that. Both uh, Donato and Angelo have, you know, upgrades to their weapons in this show that, you know, Donatello's... Uh, staff we saw it in the previous episode i think can grow a spear at the end of it well, which it, just, it doesn't uh, grow but sure uh, <laughs> it slides you know, out yeah it slides out it's a hidden it's, it's a hidden it's a hidden dagger in the tip in the edge of the yeah spear. but yeah and that turns and the staff, staff uh, it, it turns the staff into a naginita yeah and and michelangelo's nunchucks can transform into a kusari gamma chain mm -hmm. so that's nice yeah, it, it it gives them some versatility that's different from the norm. I like that. <laughs> but back so, to the episode. Metalhead. Yeah, back to the episode. So, again, this is the Donatello episode. And, again, I do like that, you know, he says, I'm going to try and fight with my brain. And then he kind of has to beat his own brain at the end. I honestly Ready? think the next episode is a better Donatello episode than this one is. Yeah. That's something I was about to bring up. That the next episode is a better than the episode this one. But I, it, one thing I do like about this is that we hear Donatello first use Buyakasha on his own. And I like how Michelangelo reacts that it sounds weird when he says it, which is probably a reference to Rob Paulson, you know, who was in the original show. So it's probably weirder to hear him say that phrase than mm -hmm. Raphael tells Mikey. It sounds weird when you say it too. So it's like, yeah, no, this uh, this phrase is just uh, weird. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter who says it. Uh, we still need to grow into it. So, yeah, you know, it works. It works as good comedy, though. Yeah, yeah, good, good inside joke. But it, overall, though, this episode doesn't really stand out to me too much, or didn't stand out to me yeah. too much, to be honest. The next episode, I think, was better as far as Donatello yeah. episodes go. So, so moving on is yeah. monkey brain. <clears throat> We're introduced um, so, to another mutated person or animal. Doc, Dr. Victor Falco. Mm -hmm. Is uh, basically But uh, before Do we before we get to him, before we get to him, I do want to say because we talk about how this is a Donatello episode and one of the things that sells us the most is just that you uh, that I love that you can just see how obsessed he is to hang out with April, which he makes an entire billboard of every possible scenario that could happen mm -hmm. in order in order for him to hang out with her. And mm -hmm. once he takes her to, you know, explore this doctor's lab, which because it may connect to Hope April's he... father, mm -hmm. uh, like Leonardo is like, he couldn't have predicted that. And then he looks at the boat. Oh, yeah. God, he did. Yeah, that was a good joke <laughs> where... He says, hey, you guys stay here and me and April go ourselves instead. It'll just be the two of us. And yeah, like I, yeah, like you said, like they make the joke of he couldn't have actually had that a part of his plan. They look at the his plans and he did have that as a part of his plan. That was a good joke. I like that one. That one made me laugh. And but... it, it comes back at the end when 
<clears throat> Linter uh, offers April to, to to train under him to be a Kunuich, which is another thing I like about the show. Yeah, because uh, but, of reasons. But you know, we should start off right, like with Doctor Vilko. You hold know, on. They, they... Hold on. Before we get to him, I just finished the part where you know. So she tells that to Donatello, and like he like goes to the board, and there's a plan for that too. He actually figured out that mm -hmm. Splinter is going to offer April. Uh, you know, training to be a Kunuich. That's really thinking ahead. Yeah. yeah. So good but on him. Going into that, though, like the reason I think this is a Donatello episode more so than anything else is because we start off with Donatello having trouble, like relaxing his mind in terms of when it comes yeah. to fighting because he wants to think he about overthinks. Every... Yeah, he overthinks. Yeah. Like if the plan thing yeah. with trying to get with April didn't, you know get the idea across he overthinks and everything and his overthinking is what ends up in him sometimes making mistakes or just getting in over his head or not being able to cope as well as some of the others can and splinter shows him this when he tries to attack mikey who's basically not paying any attention whatsoever and mikey is able to you know block him yeah block him and, and dodge him and things and Splinter shows him, like, hey, this is what you need to be able to do. And, you know, they make the yeah. joke about Mikey being mindless still yet as well. And <clears throat> Spl I like how Splinter's also a part of those jokes as well sometimes. Like, that's nice. Yeah. Also a bit like, rude as far as, yeah. Yeah, as far as you dads know, he go. Likes, he likes all of his kids, but, you know, he would take a stab at them if he could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, he definitely make, pokes fun at them as well and enjoys the jokes too, I would say. But, yeah, like, you know, this is, but the reason why I think, but again, getting back into why this is a Donatello episode, you know, that's part of the reason then, you know, him and April go to see Dr. Falco, who's missing his colleague, Dr. Rockwell, yeah. who it turns, comes to find out is actually the person who was, who turns to find out he is the monkey in this, the mutated monkey in this episode, thanks to Dr. Yes. Falco. Uh -huh. Dr. Falco turned his colleague into a monkey. And yeah, like um, uh, kind of jumping a bit ahead. That monkey comes. Back. <laughs> Do what? That monkey comes back in the future. We will see Doctor Wacko again. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I kind of figured since they let him go. But you know, you, I, I do like the ending. Where do you think a crazed monkey who, um, yeah, who yeah. can read people's emotions <laughs> is probably is the best idea to release on the city of New York? And then you just hear in the background well, people screaming and the monkey screaming and then, you know, a lot of, you know, b a car blowing up, I think, and other things. Like, 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 I, like you said, <clears throat> like you said, the, the news must be really interesting at that time. Eh, it doesn't seem to be, but anyways. <clears throat> um, yeah, but, like, uh, yeah, we move along, moving along. Yeah, yeah, there, a a, a much a better Donatello episode, I think. Uh, and again, this shows in the climax where the turtles, you know, <clears throat> um, you know, where the turtles lose because they can read everything they're trying to make, and Dante learns how he shouldn't think; he should just act. Yeah, Doctor. And that, uh, and Doctor Falco can't read him because you know he's improvising; he's not planning. Yeah. Which, yep. which you know, people have done this kind of episodes in shows before, but I do like how they approach it that you know. Improv you know, improvising is not thinking, so they can't read it. I like it. Hmm. It's a cool. It's a cool twist. Yeah, it works. Here, and I think. also, this is kind of this is the first hint that April might have a psychic ab ability in mm -hmm. her, and and again, this is something that gets explored later in the show. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's here. Yeah, you, you kind of get this thing where she sensed there was something different about the giant monkey, the giant mutated monkey, and that's when, like you said earlier, Splinter hears her talk about this, and he decides, hey, I want to train you. Do you yeah. have an ability that it took me many years of my life to develop? And I like how she, she makes a quip about, oh, well, don't feel bad about it. And he's like, no, that's not the point. I, I have the ability. It just took me a long time to train it. And she's like, oh, well, you shouldn't feel bad about that either. And he's like, and he just sighs. Like, that was a good moment between Splinter and Avery. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also like that April's uh, reaction to being taught to be a Kunuich is can be high, can be harder than high school. Um, <laughs> I beg to differ. 
Uh, but next episode, never say Zephyr. Um, you, you already mentioned that we were introduced to Zephyr in a previous episode. Mm-hmm. And here, he is, um, he is once again the ma- one of the main, the main villain of the, of the episode. Uh, what do you think of Zephyr? I like him. You definitely learn more about him in a later episode and his kind of backstory. But as it stands, I like Zephyr a lot. I think he's a really cool villain. Mm-hmm. And we're also getting, getting introduced to the Purple Dragon. Uh, crime, uh, you know, um, you know, a group of organized crimes that, you know, are a part of the original comics. They were in the 2003 show as well. So we first, we first see them in, them in this show. And another side character named Mr. Mr. Murakami, mm-hmm. who actually was actually a friend of the turtles because he's blind. So yeah. you know, he's the uh, April takes the turtles to introduce them to other types of food. Yeah. So of course, instead Which... of pizzas, they get pizza. Well, Yay. yeah. Well, Mr. Murakami well, invents pizza Giago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of course, Which... because more pizza. Yeah. But apparently, it's also very good. Surprisingly. Well, but yeah, this isn't so <laughs> fair enough. But yeah, this isn't any kind of major episode. It's mostly just kind of showing us that Zever's really good and that, you know, he's willing to cross lines that the turtles aren't. And you kind of see Raph and him have a bit of a connection and how far they're willing to go and what they're willing to do because eventually Zever kidnaps Mr. Murakami in this episode and, you know, is threatening his life and the turtles kidnap chris bradford as well in this episode and threaten their life yeah. but you realize like hey the turtles aren't willing to kill but and so they don't toss chris bradford over the edge of the tall building to let him fall to his death and by the uh, by i think <clears throat> this is the first where the thing you know the climax is like there are and there isn't like two groups fighting it. like there's the, the, the it's not just the turtles the main enemy there's the turtles against Zephyr and the foot, and they're also fighting against the purple dragons. So there's like a big fight going on, which is the first mm-hmm. time it was ever done in this <coughs> show, and I love it. But you know, it, it also shows like, hey, you know, Leonardo's mercy actually helps them in the end because one of the purple dragons helps Leonardo and gives them, you know, gives him back his sword in exchange for you mm-hmm. know letting him live and stuff like that and not killing him, right? Although I want to point out. They knock a ton of the Foot Clan off the side of this tall building and let them just fall to their deaths, assumably. So, yeah, we don't kill, yeah. but we kill. You know, it's <laughs> kind of the Batman thing. Like, of... <clears throat> yeah, ju- ju- just wait until, like, what they do to some robots as they fight in the future. Those are just robots, wait. though, technically. So it doesn't count. The Foot Clan are just regular humans, though, who are falling off the side of this building to their deaths, assumably. So... We're not going to drop Chris Bradford off the side of this building, but all these Foot Clan people we just knocked off the building. Yeah, they're dead, apparently. But we don't talk about that. I just yeah. found that kind of funny, uh, personally, <clears throat> as a thing to point out. So so next episode, we have The Gauntlet, which uh, is one of my favorite episodes of this season for a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. But uh, first, we are introduced to a new character, Pigeon Pete which uh, delivers April a message from her father, which uh, urges her and the turtles to go out and, uh, you know, mo- uh, you know, uh, attack Krang uh, from detonating a, mutagen- a mutagen bomb in the city, you know, mm-hmm. kind of a big threat, which does, uh, I forgot, but I one thing I like about the Krang is that they're, they're not good in English, so, you know, they talk yeah, I do. very... Elaborate like, and one of my favorite usages of it is in this episode where it's like, "Crank in how many of the thing of the time they made, the time frame be, humans call refer to as minutes? Will the device that the crank know refers to as the bomb is going to explode? Five. Yeah, <laughs> I like how you know it's probably even longer in the actual episode, but the answer is just five. That's it, just five. Um, but uh, so yeah, the turtles attack them. They manage to defuse the bomb, and but they can't celebrate just yet because the shredder shows up. 
And, yeah, this you know, is their first real fight with the actual with you know with Shredder himself, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this show, yes, and it is worth mentioning because you know the '87 version of the Shredder was was pretty you know was a, was ridiculous. You know, he was an, we he was the arch enemy, but one to one, he was ridiculous. In the two, the 2003 series. The first uh, live action movie did make him a bit more, you know, threatening. And in the in the comics, it is an issue. But this show really made him like a better. Like when you see them fighting, you can see how you know he's an evil splinter mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes. And you can see how confident he is in his abilities. And you know, he's been you know the trail the toes have been trained for fifteen years, give or take. He has way more years of experience than them. And you can see that he beats them hard. Yeah. And, you, and we should also a, say this is after they beat his, <clears throat> after they beat Bradford and Zever, who are turned into Dog Pound and Fish Face. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, which is, uh, you know, these are the mutant uh, forms that will, mm -hmm. you know, for, for Zephyr, Fish Face will be his main transformation. <coughs> Dog Pound. We'll get to this later, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, that that's the thing that saves them. That you know, Zephyr and uh, Bradford being changed is the one thing that gives the turtles their chance to run away. Yeah. Because yeah, and at this point, Splinter uh, tells them that they are officially in a war, and that leads us to the next. Episode. Yeah, and like you know, and it's this loss that you see in this ne next episode that I think you know really kind of sells shredder's strength and just how mm -hmm. terrible he can be because you see we start off with a nightmare involving the shredder and the turtles and it ends up being splinter's nightmare instead and so yeah splinter ends up saying like hey you're not ready for this you're not able to you're not allowed to go back up to the surface ever again it, but you know and I he throws you. them into yeah and he throws them into very extensive training <clears> like 24 <throat> 7 they can barely sleep and we should say this is episode ten. We we're now talking about. We've moved on. This yeah, is panic in the 10. sewers. Panic in the sewers. Yeah, and uh, but uh, again, I do I do like that. You know, despite Shredder kicking their ass, they do manage. They do still show that they're capable of fighting back when he sends an attack on their own. We should say though, they do try and attack Dog Pound earlier in this episode and they do lose very badly because of that fear right because they've yeah. been off because they've been put off balance because of that fear and not only not only the fear but also the extra exhaustion from all the trainings they went through mm -hmm. and, and i do like this right because it shows at the end of this episode when the turtles do kind of overcome that fear and some of that exhaustion and mostly the fear i'll say like when they overcome that fear they're able to take down dog pound and the foot clan and stop and the purple dragons and stop them from being able to destroy the sewers and the turtles lair and you kind of hear a splinter at the end of this episode say hey this was my fault i put you through this and i'm sorry for that right mm -hmm. i need to have more yeah. faith in you mm -hmm. like i like that it kind of shows that hey splinter's not perfect either he does have his faults yeah, he has his faults, but you know he does act this way because he cares. He loves them, and he wants them to be safe. But at the same time, this is not really the way. Mm -hmm. Well, um, anything else to say about episode ten? Uh, no, I don't think so. You, you know, a, a good tech, not quite a two-parter, but I think a good continuation of the previous episode and their fight with Shredder and what it meant for them. You know, yes. Development wise. With that said, episode eleven, Mauser's attack, mm -hmm. and this is a reference to the old cartoon. I think it's also uh. in the comics, where where the where Baxter Stockman is the one that creates the, the Mausers, which is a device that they actually created to like that you know track down rats. So it's supposed to like lead them to Splinter. But uh, it's not, it doesn't necessarily do that, if I recall correctly. No. In this show? Okay. I mean, they do, But uh, the monsters can uh, like, track, but we'll kind of get into it. But yeah, this one starts off as a, you know, April gets mugged by the purple dragons. 
And the turtles say, hey, let's go out and stop the purple dragons and get April's phone back. And Splinter tells them, hey, you don't need to fight every single battle. You can, by doing so, put yourself in an even worse position. And like this, mm-hmm. you know, and they kind of use that to great effect, to great effect an example in this episode where they go out to fight the purple dragons. And instead, they end up met with the with Baxter Stockman's Mausers who end up stealing from the purple dragons. Mm-hmm. And this is something that like uh, that, you know, because fans always have like uh, you know, their who's the best turtle, who would do this, who would do that. You, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That uh, so I uh, one thing that I found interesting is that we have, you know, we have uh, Leo and Raph uh, calling, kind of calling the uh, Donnie and Mikey, they kind of uh, kind of referring to them as that uh, as that way. You know, we, you know, we're better. We can handle stuff by ourselves. We don't necessarily need Donnie and Mikey. But and then when they get into trouble, um, Donnie and Mikey are the ones that have to save them. So... The A team, the A team and B team thing, yeah. Like, yeah, it was a good back and forth where neither one wants to call on the other, but in both end up through their kind of competitive nature. Um, Which is something that you know that you know uh, because this is kind of a plot episode that in other shows I could see would return every few seasons, mm-hmm. but in this you can tell that they learn from them. This yeah. kind of plot never comes back Mm-mm. in any in is any good. of the future seasons. Which is good. So I like it. Yeah, you know each channel is appreciated for who he is, but, and I like that. In the you know idea of like saying like hey not every battle is worth fighting. They end up, because they go after the phone, one of the purple dragons takes the phone to Dog Pound, who ends up saying, you know, hey, we can use this phone, and plus the purple dragons capture Baxter Stockman, who they get to crack the phone, and it's, you know, and they only were able to do this because the turtles decided to interfere. If they wouldn't have, obviously, none of that would have happened, right? Because the purple Um, dragons wouldn't have known about the phone, and they wouldn't have met Baxter Stockman. And this indeed leads to, you know, Baxter Stockman eventually won the Shredder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like they eventually take Baxter Stockman to the Shredder and he ends up creating, you know, legs that uh, Zever or Fishface can use to walk around now and not be stuck in the water anymore because otherwise mm-hmm. he was completely useless to the Shredder. Indeed. But yeah, like so... overall, this is a good little episode for all the turtles to learn something and kind of point out that hey you know this was a battle that they didn't have to fight and could have been completely avoided and they made worse in trying to go out and fight this battle a nice little tidbit thing that splinter got to teach them something and they all kind of took something from it as well like yeah good episode i like this one okay so with that said episode 12 it came it came from the dead mm-hmm. uh, which is our first introduction to leatherhead mm-hmm um, um vo- voiced by Peter Louis, who you may know as Hashirama Senju from Naruto. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what you want me to add to that. Know... Uh, I have to remember... Who was that? Ah yes, okay. okay yeah. actually... It's been a while since I've watched Naruto. All right, <coughs> forgive okay. me. Hashirama, okay, and also Hashirama is not a character who you see a ton of until like way later in like uh, Naruto sh- show wise. Dude, I'm I'm just going over the first tool I see. Is, uh, but yeah, he's he's a good VA. Answer, so. He's a good VA, hands down yeah. a very good VA. Okay, so they come across that head was. And they bring him back up. to the land. Okay, no, you're, oh. fine. No, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Uh, so the turtles find him, you know, as he's being attacked by the Krang, and they bring him back to the land. And, you know, he's at the beginning, he's like very against them. Like, he, you can see that he's not thinking clearly. And when they bring him back to the land, he's actually beating them up. And that's one top part I really like about the episode where we, for the first time, we see Splinter kicking Leatherhead's ass. Yeah. And you, you can see just, you know, for as wise and uh, for as wise as he can be, Splinter is also pretty deadly on, uh, in a one on Yeah, this is the first time um, we actively get to see Splinter himself fight as well. And you can see, like, hey, he's, you know, the master and sensei for a reason. 
and you kind of get a bit of that here now. Yeah. And it's nice to see that, I think. And I do think with Leather, with Leatherhead, they have moments like, for one, he and the Mikey really bond, and mm-hmm. their friendship uh, continues uh, for throughout the series. But uh, another thing I like is that, you know, the turtles are kind of going out to, you know, uh, Leo, Raph, and Donnie are going out to explore while Mikey bonds with Leatherhead. And um, Mikey tells them, yo, Leatherhead is completely off the chain. It's like, you set him free? And it's like, no, off the chains means he's cool. Oh, okay. And that's why I set him free. <laughs> mm-hmm. Again. And I do like how and, Donnie continues to get upset because Leatherhead continues to attack his face. Yeah. And that's just a running <laughs> gag the-, the show uses in the future as well. Yeah. And that's another thing I like when Leo asks Leatherhead about the crank and, you know, he, start, he starts being angry. It's like, hey, Leo, what, how about you start with, like, a, like an accident? How was your day? It's like, how was your day? It was terrible. Yeah, because of the crank. And then Leatherhead. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of good jokes in this episode, I think. Kind of at Leatherhead's expense in terms of his anger issues, but still, like, they were good jokes, though. Like, they used it well, I think. And and you also even had a good uh, line from Swinter where, you know, he tells Mikey, like, hey, you're the one who has to bond with Leatherhead. And, you know, they ask him, like, are we going to keep him unchained? And he said, oh, no, I'm not crazy. You know, and Swinter (laughs) Swinter says, no, I'm not crazy. You're going to chain him up. Just bond with him while he's chained up. Like, that was a good little moment. I like that. (laughs) Humor from Splinter is good humor. Yeah, Splinter is good. And speaking of Splinter, next episode... Mm. I monster. So Dr. Victor Falco is back, who mm. is now the known villain, like a, a villain for that's known throughout the digital history, known as the Rat King, and mm. and he's taking over Sprinter's mind. He's and, taking, he takes over all the rats of New York and uses them to try and get rid of the people in New York, and eventually ends up taking over Splinter's mind as well. Mm. Yeah. This is yeah. a fun little episode. Like um, we definitely learn a bit more about Splinter and kind of how he sees himself in the show, right? And how he yes, um, doesn't exactly you... want to accept his mutated nature, right? Like he still wants to believe that he is human. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And then we also have a, a we have like when the rats attack April and the tunnels come to say that there are two parts are like one is when. Like, you know, they are hanging on from this uh, electricity pole. Yeah. And April is like, how is this uh, better than, uh, you know, how is this better than getting eaten by the rats? And Mikey is like, at least this will be quick <laughs> with rats as they chew and chew and chew mm-hmm. and chew. And it keeps on going. And then when they get rid of the rats, Leo, Leo like, says something that he thinks is clever and funny. And everyone is, like, looking at him like, are you serious? And it's like, oh, come on, that's cool. And again, I like that the leader has these moments that, you know, Mm -hmm. he's still trying to be a leader. He still thinks that saying dorky catchphrases is what makes him a good leader. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. And also, you know, when a splinter is uh, sleeping and, uh, you know, they they are trying to poke him with Donatello's staff and it accidentally becomes the... Turns out that they use the side, the side with the knife, and mm-hmm. it's like, okay, why won't we try this with the other hand? It, it, like, it's simple jokes, but the delivery really makes them. Yeah, it does. Like, yeah, I agree. So uh, I will say again, like I said, fun episode, but there's a not there's kind of a sequel in the next season, which I think is so much better. Ah, so, well, no spoilers then, but yeah, like this, I think yeah. it it does it it you know it, it shows us Doctor Victor Falco again. It kind of introduces him as the Rat King now because he gets mutated as well, and I love mm-hmm. by the way like his kind of sc- scarecrowish design. Like that was actually really neat, and how oh, yeah, in terms of, like definitely. a very creepy thing. And I like how they kind of use that. Like I think they use it to good effect in this episode. Mm-hmm. His design and everything, yeah, and it works. Yeah, his design is right. Like mm-hmm. it's. Uh, overall good ep- fun episode enjoyable episode nothing to write majorly home about we learned a bit more about splinter in his past but i don't think it's anything that we hadn't already known really 
It's just just most. That's uh, if you again, if you want a stronger episode with Splinter and the Rat King, you have you have an episode in the next season, which mm-hmm. I'm sure you'll like. Fair enough. But this one was you know a, a good little bit, a good episode. Mm-hmm. Okay. Moving with on. that said, we have episode fourteen now. Another one of my favorites, New Girl in Town. And this, because this episode is the introduction of one of my favorite characters. Yep. It is Cries Karai. Definitely, Karai's Vo- definitely great. Voiced, voiced by Kelly Hu, who people may know as Lady Deathstrike in, X- in X-Men 2. And, and there's a sex symbol, sadly. But actually, one of the things she's doing right now is she's voicing Adira in the Tangled series. To those who follow that. Mm-hmm. So with that said, we have Karai, which I <laughs> love in this show. Yeah, she's great. Uh, but uh, and, uh, so, uh, uh, but another thing I like about it is this is the first time we kind of, we really go into Leo's role as the leader. Mm-hmm. That you know he has to make choices on a dime. And Raphael constantly criticizes him for that. And then Leo tells him, you know what? You want the team? Take the team. I'm out. And, you know, and then we actually see why Leonardo is a better leader than Raphael. You know, Raphael is a hothead. He thinks he's done. We're just attacking, not thinking. And, but when um, Leo talks to Splinter about it, he says, is it too much to ask for a bit of appreciation when I have to carry the entire team? And Splinter tells them, yes, it is too much. You, you, are, you know, he tells them the hard truth that you, can, you can't necessarily just be appreciated for being the one who has to think of. You have to accept, the, you have to accept that criticism is going to follow you in its uh, role. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a nice little thing is of being leader and all that. It also kind of shows like, Raph's not cut out for being leader, too, because, you know, he learns that Leonardo has to deal with putting the lives of, you know, his brothers in danger all the time. And he has to deal with that, and he has to put up with that, and he has to be ready to accept that, right? And you can see this when Ra- in later in the episode, like, this is a reintroduction. Like, Snakehead's kind of the background villain of this episode somewhat. Because, yeah, Snake Weed, sorry, comes back as the background villain of this episode. Yeah, and yeah he's a background villain. It's through Raph... Mikey and Donatello dealing with that and Mikey getting hurt that Raph completely freezes up as a leader. He can't make a decision because, you know, Mikey gets hurt because of his decisions and he can't deal with that and he can't accept that and it bothers him a lot. And that's when he sees like, hey, that's kind of the cost of being a leader. That's what it takes to be a leader and he doesn't like it. Mm-hmm. And he, that's when he learns no. like a newfound respect for Leonardo and what it means to be a leader. And then and again, it's really good. Yeah, but I so think, now to the second. Yeah, the second. The, the other stuff, the other stuff in this episode mm-hmm. of the show, as I mentioned, Karai. And so I think Karai is, was always kind of didn't really care for, not necessarily, not necessarily something that had to do with her. I just, you know, didn't know much about her, mm-hmm. aside from the fact that she is the Shredder's daughter. Spoilers. And then, and then so my first introduction. Spoilers. To- Jeez, spoilers. We didn't find it out in this episode. Well, no, we don't. We don't find out that she's... Yeah, we do. That is true, but... The tellers don't find out until later, yeah. but... Yeah, so uh, spoilers. Jeez. Jeez. Well, but we know this <laughs> as the audience, so shut the hell up. But, um, you know, I know that about her, and pretty much it, because my introduction to her was the 2007 movie, which tells us nothing about it. Mm. And, you know, the 2003 series I've barely seen, this was my kind of introduction. Man, what an introduction. Because, um, so, for one, I like her design. I like yeah. the black hair with a bit of blonde in it. I like the armor. And, um, you know, uh, you, Kelly, whose voice is magnificent. Yeah, she and, does really well. And also, in this show, she has a, you know, she has a, a kind of an on and on, on and on and off again, friendly rivalry with Leo, mm-hmm. which I like that you know he he tries to he tries to impress, but you know she you can tell that she's kind of in an and him they are equal, but she had more excessive training. 
because you know she's you know, she's been trained by the shredder who is a bit uh, is a bit less merciful. Well, you can also see it, it seems like Leo's a bit smitten with her in the same way that Donnie's, you know, smitten with April as well. Yeah, and speaking of April, uh, my favorite the episode that when Leo actually comes to April's house and he tells her, like, in the middle of the night, he, he's like, I can can we talk? Can I wait until the morning? I met this girl and she just grabs him, tell me everything. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's, so freaking accurate you have no idea it's adorable <laughs> it's an adorable little moment i agree and i like how she listens to everything she he has to say until he tells her she's in the foot clan and she just slaps him with a newspaper mm -hmm. it's like yikes <laughs> april knows what's up and another uh, when raf tries to find leo and donnie tells him uh, you know he He's uh, going to the Baxter building. April texted me and he's like, oh my God, April texted me. This is the best day ever. And then he hears Michelangelo got hurt in, in the battle groaning. And it's like, oh, you know, it had, you know, this day actually has its sounds. Yeah. It was a good little joke. Mm -hmm. Fun, funny moments are funny. What? So, um, uh, yeah, anything else? Anything you want to say? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have a back and forth with Karai. You talked about Karai as a great character. And, you know, we kind of end with Leo and Raph fighting with Snakeweed and Karai kind of helping Leo end up, kind of helping Leo at the end of it all and them being able to beat Snakeweed. And we end with Snakeweed's not dead yet again. He'll come back eventually. Woo. That's it. <laughs> Moving on to the next episode. Uh, mm hmm. Next episode, episode 15, which the is Alien Agenda. Kind of a continuation on the past episode because we're still dealing with Karai. Mm -hmm. We still have Karai, which, uh, you know, Leo wants to trust, but they still don't feel like oh, she's doesn't. fully trusted. Mikey and Donnie Raph still doesn't. don't know that Karai is a thing yet. Mm -hmm. and, well, and the big yeah. villain with this one is, you know, the Krang, and they get their first look at, and the turtles get to go to high school for a day because they mm -hmm. have to deal with and save April from a Krang bot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that woman. Mm. <laughs> that woman is a... You know, but uh, I do like that they go to that school and Mikey sees that the poster for like a Viking show that the school has no. and he's like... Not we, a show, it's a football team, but anyways. Yeah, a football team, and it's like, we need to take them down. It seems like they have the, they have it coming. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I like it. Yeah, it, it, nice little jokes, because, you know, they wouldn't know any better. It's nice little jokes like that. I enjoy it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they do actually that lab to the Crank Research Facility. And, you know, which I think... It, is it no it's a, it's in another episode i, I confuse it with something mm -hmm. but um so they meet a carider and yeah like they, the big thing for this is and they find this thing oh go ahead uh, they find this creature which uh, one thing i like is that you know mikey has this running thing where he named the creatures and you know then he comes across this thing and is that uh, he just can't find the name for this and he's like you know what let's just call him justin <laughs> mm -hmm. I like that. That was you know, the, that one got the me. most yeah the, like it's the most random name you can think of thing but you know it won't yep and agreed by the end and by the end of the fight uh, leo does realize that karai betrayed them because she loved them to find this thing uh, on their name you know she just left but it, you know, um, it's nice to see, like you know, hey, she kind of cares about the world a little bit, and the fact that she wants to save it and stop the Krang, right? And so mm -hmm. she's trying to fight the Krang and convince Shredder, like, hey, Shredder, your old feud isn't worth it if the world is destroyed. And he's like, I don't care. I'm only focused on defeating Hamato Yoshi. And, yeah. And, you know, this is, and so when she steals one of the bits from the Krang, it, you know, they use that technology from the Krang in order to help Zever. And, you know, Baxter Stockman uses the technology from the Krang in order to help Zever. Later. You are talking about the next episode. Uh, somewhat, right? But, I mean, you know, y you see that in this episode, though. 
we're in a you position. see a start of it, yeah. You, you know, you see... We're still in 15. Yeah, uh, the alien Because the, it does end with the idea that, uh, for one, this is one of the things I like, that whenever you see her, you're not entirely sure on which side she's on. Yeah. Uh, and um, so that's one. And two, the other thing I like about this is that um, when, you know, they come back home and, you know, people, and, you know people are looking at Leonardo for answers, yeah, I know, I admit, I kind of like her and I want to believe she's not evil, but, uh, but you know, I realize now this was kind of a, kind of a mistake. Well, you even and see Splinter the, Time, like, hey, like, you know, trust her or don't trust her, it's completely up to you. Like, you have to figure that out on your own. Yeah, like, it's but nice. it still does, I mean, it's still... But, um... I, but yeah, that's uh, it for this episode. Move on to next one, the Pulverizer, mm -hmm. with which uh, just uh, you know continues with voice acting trivia. Pulverizer is voiced by Roger Craig Smith, known to the public as Chris Redfield in the Resident Evil games, as Ezio from the Assassin's Creed games, and the current English voice of our Lord and Savior Sonic the Hedgehog. Man, they gave him. Such a good actor, and they give him the worst role in this entire show. <laughs> yeah. I didn't yeah. think it was possible to make a character more annoying than Michelangelo, but they did it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I hate think this know... character. Okay, and, uh, you know, so you'll probably be He's happy. Not funny. That... And then you'll be happy to hear that after this uh, season, he only has one more episode. Woo. Never be again. <laughs> so. That's yeah. a good thing. But, but like you said, there's, um, there's you know, uh, we see Baxter Stockland starting using crank technology in order to help mm -hmm. uh, fish, you know, Zephyr, because it makes uh, legs for him to walk. We also, we also uh, see the turtles are using the crank technology too somewhat, in the mm -hmm. fact that we have because, the shell racer. Yeah, the shell racer, uh, which is their new ride. It's kind of a... This is kind of their version to the parody wagon from the original 80s cartoon. So we have that. And as they're going on patrol with a discover pulverizer. Just want to point out, to be... we have this giant subway car driving down the streets of New York and everyone just, no one reacts to this. We see this well, giant I, subway car joyriding they... down the streets of New York and we just see people walk by it. It's like, yeah, that's normal. Nothing new about that. That happens in New York all the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. No. Uh, well, um, no one reacts. Yeah, uh, it bothers me. Okay. Nobody okay, reacts. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, we have the pulverizer, which I think is based on a character, on a kid character that tried to be a part of the Ninja Turtles in one episode of the '80s cartoon, only more annoying, maybe. I don't remember mm. that kid uh, all that much. But yeah, the pulverizer is not okay, is not the best of characters, and I honestly don't even remember this episode much. I just remember, you know, he's there. Yeah, it's mostly focused on him razor. and focused on the show razor and focused on the pulverizer and kind and of they, Donatello and teaching him somewhat. And even and even and even the turtles don't like him. No, so... no one likes him. Mm -hmm. So For good uh, reason. moving he's on. Annoying. And sure, maybe he's designed to be that way, but the jokes just don't land, in my opinion. It's just really yeah. poor jokes. Again, like I said, he doesn't appeal for any more. He just has one more episode because he has more one more episode in this season and one more in the other in season two, and then he just being forgotten. This so... is a good thing. Mm -hmm. This is no great loss. We're... I well, thought for a minute, that said, I thought for a minute this was going to be their introduction to like the um, I forget the character's name, but the hockey stick dude who wears who ah was, Casey Jones. Yeah, Casey. I thought this was going to be our introduction wait, to him, and this was going to be that character in my. It's going to be like, oh dear God, please no. Season two, season two. Uh, That's yeah, all I'll say about I'm, Casey. I'm sure of that, but like I thought this was going to be the Casey character, and like they were just going to build him up in this okay, way. Okay, so and no, you yeah. can, you can be grateful. I'm no. great, very grateful that that's not going to be the case because, dear God, please know if that was going to be the case. Mm -hmm. With that said, episode seventeen, <laughs> Tis, 
TCRI. Mm-hmm. So this is our this is our first production. This shows version of one of the biggest uh, names well, we should, in the Tolos we, universe. We forgot to mention, if I'm not mistaken, the power cell was stolen in the last episode, so that's why we're going here. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. But uh, the thing about TCRI is that this is an establishment that's very important in the Tolos lore because in most versions, this is where the mutagen that created the Tolos was made, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and you know, in, it, it depends on the versions. In some versions, it's just a lab. In some, it's you know, it's a lab hosted by you know, the Utrams. And here, it's a, it's a seen as the base of operations for the Krang. Mm-hmm. So the and and the, we can see that the Krang have a bigger plan why the te, you know teleporting the you know more Krang into Earth, which is what the turtles are trying to stop. Yes, and uh, but and I really like so I like to see you know the turtles kind of fighting the crank in their home base, and I like that giant rock monster that they have to take out. Uh, it's just an action-packed episode, and 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 another thing I like about it is you know that Mikey has this obsession with the Olympics, and you you all show that he's going to do something stupid regarding this like he's going to bl- he's going to blow their cover and then not only it's not him that blows their cover it's he actually goes all right and and they're looking at like what's what's so fun about this and he's like somebody 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 triggered the alarm and it's not me mm-hmm. so again another another good one I enjoyed this one oh, a lot. Yeah. And also, we have Leatherhead in this episode, and April kind of makes a cool little, you know, does a little cool bit and has a cool moment in this episode where she kind of gets them into TCRI and like has a neat little thing with the yo-yo and keeping the Krang off of her and away from her and everything. It's neat, you know, a good little yeah. moment from her. But I think you know the big thing is Leatherhead sacrificing himself to try and stop the portal and everything for a time and delay the Krang, right? Yeah. A nice little moment. Mm-hmm. And, and also the moment uh, we have the end of this episode where they steal a Krang data storage device and we find out that the Krang weren't after April's father, they were after her. April herself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which again is something that the show will get more into as we go along. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With, with that said, episode 18, Cockroach Tam- Terminator. This is a thing that the show made up for. Ah, uh, it's neat. I, I like the creativity in it. You know, I, I like mm-hmm. the kind of, there's a lot of references to one, obviously the Terminator and two kind of what feels like the predator in terms of when we get the cockroach vision, it looks like the predator vision that you see from the old predator movies. Yeah. Have you seen so, any of those? Yeah, I've seen those. Um, yeah, like, again, I, I, kind, I, I like the references uh, in this episode, but it's not anything I think is standout worthy, right? It's just the Krang are doing a thing. We got to stop them. Donnie creates a spy roach. The spy roach gets mutated as well, and it me- and it melds the, you know, organic with the technological part of the spy roach. Like they had a camera on him, so the camera gets merged with the roach in the mutation, and then the roach decides that he has to destroy Raphael because Raphael tried to attack him before because Raphael didn't know better and. That's just kind of an episode of destroying the roach and stopping the crane, and that's it. <laughs> Not much to say about this one, really. It's fun. Yeah, but you it's know, creative. it's a it's a cool it's a cool episode. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, it's not anything that I think is standout worthy, but it's definitely I like some of the creativity behind it. Well, on that note, we have episode nineteen, Baxter's Gambit. Mm-hmm. Now, this one I like. I think this is definitely one of my more favorite episodes of this season, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, if this yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the one where um, yes. the solos and, uh, and Bradford and the uh, together. I like this one. Yeah, like we see Dog Pound and Fish Face and the Turtles have to work together because Baxter tries to betray them all. Mm-hmm. And I do, and you know, I really in a lot of, uh, you know, creative imagery in, ty- in the types of um, obstacles. Like, they have this uh, 
point, point where they are in the check, like in the checkmate arena, and they need to figure out what's an opening, what's a where can where can they go, all, all stuff. And I just remember this being a being a creative episode. Yeah, well, I actually also really enjoyed the flashback of Zever's past and everything, and how he got to the point yeah. where he's at, and how he started working with. Um, <laughs> You know shredder and everything and working for them and the for the foot kind and all of that and i and i like how Raphael and you can see Raphael and zephyr kind of bond a little bit and they have this kind of mutual respect for one another and when they start working yes. together and they learn how similar they actually are and, and you also you know of, you're not three dimensional character yeah it's nice shocking <laughs> it's actually really nice to see that though it's nice to kind of have that back and forth between these two characters and see how similar they are in, in terms of, you know, their character and stuff like that. And, and you kind of see that culminate into this ending moment where, y you know, you see at the end of this episode, Raphael senses that Zever tries to kill Leonardo and, you know, stops it with his side, you know, stops the saw blade ball thing with his side and all that. Yeah. And, you know, he says like, hey, you, know, you can kind of see like, hey, I respect him, but he's still an enemy. He's still going to try and take us out whenever he gets the chance, right? I like that. This was a good episode. Is this, question for you though, is this the last of Baxter Stockman? Because it looks like he's blown up in this episode. Um, no. no. I didn't no, no, think no, no. so. If, if you're familiar with Toro's history, and by that I mean watch the 80s cartoon. I'm not. There's, okay, so and there's something for him in the Fair enough. Uh, which you will have to see. Fair enough. It looks like they. It looks like that might have been the end of his character in this episode for how they do it. But that's neat. I'll, yeah, know, I'll be I interested to see how so he comes too. back. I'll be interested to see how I he comes so back. Too, but, also, uh, spoilers. You just spoiled me. I thought he was dead. Now I know he's not dead. Wow, HC. You, I, you I, asked me. So. I know. I'm giving you our time. <laughs> I know, but uh, at least makes sense. You're getting rusty, hmm. but. Uh, but this was a great okay, episode. Well, that's a, I think this was definitely yeah. one of my top episodes. Uh, actually, I, I I will uh, say that one thing I like is that when they actually get out of there, they are try, they kind of want to fight each other, like the yeah. turtles and the uh, and like uh, you know what we'll tell you. Yeah, you know, let's just I, call it. Yeah, let's just call it here. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah, that, that's, that, good. that's fun. Um, that you know they're so used to this by the point that it's just like another day at the office. Mm -hmm. but, like yeah, you know what we'll do this later. So episode 20, fun fact, this episode aired three days before my birthday. Mm -hmm. And and man, what an awesome birthday gift it was, was that, because I love this. Like, for one, we have Mokarai. Mokarai is always good. And then we, and again, kind of going into this entire thing, not only don't the turtles know if she's a friend or a foe or anything, this is really the the audience doesn't know either because it seems like she's trying to actually befriend the tra the turtles because she's sick of Shredder. But at the same time, what if it's all a plan and how far against Shredder is she willing to go? Because you can see that the turtles have a chance to take Shredder out for good, as in killing him, and she and she defends him. She saves him. And that's the point where she actually reminds Leonardo and the turtles that she's Shadow's daughter. Yeah. And you know, and again, and again, we have another fight between the turtles and the Shredder, which is like you know, we saw how you know we saw how uh, Shredder kind of kicked their asses in in episode nine. Now we see that again, and you can tell them a bit more. They know more of what to expect, but at the same time, he still has experience. He's like he's still, still he's still the badass. He's still this kind of scary villain that they're not sure they can take. But you can see like they're more willing to try at this point, and you can see like the Shredder's not able to completely get rid of them at this point either. And in the fact that like they're able to stand up to him somewhat, like I, you can see the growth in the turtles from the first point where they had to deal with the Shredder to now, you can see the growth, and it's nice to see that. <laughs> and uh, that's... Um, Would you like to repeat I'm that? Not sure in what you went out there. Uh, am I okay now? Yeah, you're good right now. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure in what episode this was, where uh, we kind of skipped over it, that uh, we see April training with Splinter, and he kind and you know he kind of wants to give her a weapon 
that she could start training with. And oh, yeah, that was. Uh, she, I forget. Uh, yeah, we definitely. I, I think past it was, that. I think it was it a past was, episode. Yeah, I think. It, yeah, it was. I think it was the episode. I'm not sure, but uh, it might have been this episode. This, no, 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 no. It's an earlier episode because. Uh, the the weapon comes back into play the next episode. Yeah, so I know I that. Know it was earlier. Yeah. So, but anyway, okay. at this point, you know, April is still training with Splinter, mm -hmm. and you know, it's still, you know, and it's still kind of, um, in you know, it's still implied that she's not trained enough. And uh, the one of the in terms of comedy, one of the stuff I like is the Donatello actually. You know what? It could be fun to have a Kunuich by our side and try. Uh, what about me? And uh, you know, it puts him on the mm. spot. I remember. Yeah, that was a a major joke in this episode where you know he just keeps digging the hole deeper and deeper and deeper until eventually Raph just runs up and grabs him and says, "You'll thank me later," and just drags him off with his hand. <laughs> yeah, you will thank me later. You'll thank me later. Yeah, that was a good joke. I like that one. Okay, so and there's a, and another joke. Is that after the turtles find out that um, you know Karai is uh, Shadow's daughter, that breaks Lee heart, mm -hmm. and you know, and Mikey tries to comfort him, and he doesn't. I know the feeling, bro. With me, it was leprechauns, and Leo tells him, "Are you seriously comparing what I'm going through right now to when you found out that leprechauns aren't real?" And Mikey's like, "Leprechauns aren't real," mm -hmm. and. As Leo tells him this, you can see Donnie and Raph in the background, like, no, abort, do not say it. <laughs> Maybe it's a bit stupid, but I like it. No, it's it's okay. nice moments. It's nice to have little, like, background animation moments like that. It really sells the world more. Mm -hmm. And the scenes. I agree. Yeah. So we have that, and... What uh, else do I have to say about this episode? I'm trying to think, and good job, HC. I just accidentally closed the episode well, list, um, but I don't remember what the next. At the 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 very end of this episode, in of episode twenty, we have you know Shredder capturing yeah, we do. a Krang. Yeah, we have Shredder capturing a Krang, which does hint at their future alliance. Which mm -hmm. you know, we you should if you are familiar with, the, especially again the eighties show, you should have seen. Is coming, yeah. Because, but then, um, yeah, I do like uh, that. You know, they kind of build it up. They kept you in defense. Would they actually team up? And then mm -hmm. you see this, and you're like, oh, she is about to go down. I like it. Yeah. And it and that leads us to episode twenty one, Karai's Vendetta. Mm -hmm. Now, this uh, this is another great episode, like which is you know. Um, they kind of realize, you know what, going after the turtle, the, now Karai really wants the, to hold the turtle. Like, they're no longer maybe friends, they're enemies. I want them dead. And um, she decides to go after, and is it not, she decides to go after April once the turtles are out on a mission to save the city's wonder. Yeah. So, and that's a, that's a really interesting one because Again, Karai tries to play it off like like she's a friend to April, mm -hmm. which kind of makes you think that if this if you know they weren't they decide, would they actually be good friends? Possible. Yeah, it's definitely may it's definitely a maybe. Mm -hmm. And then and then we see you which, cut out you know, there. Would you she, like to repeat that? Uh, that we see April using our which is interesting, but um, am I okay? You can still hear Mostly. You're cutting in and out a little bit, but you're mostly okay. Uh, how about now? We'll see. Okay. So, uh, but we have uh, that, that fun between April and Karai, which is, you know, which is good. Yeah. Well, I think the main focus on this is the fight between Karai and April, and getting to see like you know april's decently skilled at evading karai but the second they actually have to fight one another like karai definitely has way more experience than her and is way better trained right mm -hmm. yeah like um like you know um the only reason april wins in that fight is because she catches karai off guard with the 
Yeah, yeah we learned that April lost her mother, the same as Karai, you know, and they and Karai held, you know, has sympathy for her, and April uses that to her advantage and kind of flips her off of her and runs away. And that's how she gets away mm-hmm. from Karai. During all this time, the turtles are, like you said, fighting the Krang in their underwater base and trying to stop them from turning, you know, the you know Earth water Earth's water into Krang water, quote unquote. Yeah, and that's kind of which is again another thing with the comedy show that I like how you know Karai, you know Karai is chasing, um, you know Karai is chasing April, and then like uh, Leo tells them they are okay. Be quiet and don't tell us. Do you have to say that every time we're ninjas, we're nowhere supposed to be quiet? The phone rings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, t- and the expression on Leo and Raph's faces when the phone starts, and you know, they have this back and forth that Don is so pressured to go help April, and then Don uh, tells them, you know, the, the water can poison all the people in the town, which last time I checked includes April. <laughs> so let's. And so again, I do, I do like the back and forth all the characters. And Mikey, and you know, Mikey really wanted to dance. That's fun. Uh, but again, the big uh, takeaway from this fight between April and Karai, which you know, April does manage to get the upper hand despite a lack of experience. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Moving on. Moving on. Uh, would you like to take this one? I just want to quickly arrange something here. You're making me talk. Okay, episode 22, The Pulverizer Returns. Boo, moving on. <laughs> episode 23. Okay, okay. You know what? I think you, you broke. You just... I know, right. You broke up. That's right. Episode 23. Uh, <laughs> uh, hold on. Am I okay now? You're fine now. Okay. But we're on episode 23 Basically, now. Yeah, so just a <laughs> no, just a few quick things about twenty two. Fair One, enough. One, I do like I do like uh, Splinter's uh, idea of letting the turtles fight. I with don't. It's weapons. so st- this is so stupid. It's like, hey, fight with new weapons now, but go also go out and fight the ha- the the Foot Clan and the rest of your enemies. And you using know that other the, you know you know that the Foot is actually a parody of the hand. Yes, the I know. Room. Right. I know, I know this. <laughs> okay. My point, that's why I made, I, I didn't mean to make the mistake, but yes, I do know that's a parody thing, like the big joke going back and forth on Daredevil and the Ninja Turtles. Point is, this is such a stupid idea from Splinter. It's like, hey, I'm going to make you switch weapons. Train with the other, per- train with the other turtle, train with the other turtle's weapon. But also continue to do this when you're out fighting for your lives against the foot. It's like, huh? This seems kind of stupid. Like, you should know better than to have them do this in the moment, right? Like, training, sure. When they're outside of training, probably not, because it's probably going to get them killed. But no, it sounds, it's a great idea. This is good training. Uh, I, I, I just, like it. I think this is stupid. I, I like the idea. I think this I is like dumb. This is just... Mm. I, okay, fair <laughs> um, It's not a good again, episode. I, I, uh, and again, uh, there are a few good comedy bits, but yeah, I agree overall. But uh, so episode twenty three now. But, well, but was, uh, we should end with the pulverizer gets ter- gets mutated as well because that's what he wanted. He gets mutated into a really ugly blob monster. Fitting, mm-hmm. very fitting. Um, the, uh, okay, so since you don't care about this character, this guy becomes a mutagen man in the second season, Ooh. and. But, uh, yeah, who cares? Moving on. Uh, <laughs> I'm so... sorry. This is definitely not a favorite episode of mine. This was a very weak overall episode, I feel. Not just counting the pulverizer, but also Splinter's method of teaching with the different weapon. None of it pays off in this episode. None of it works. It's just not a good episode, I feel. Probably <laughs> one of the weakest episodes of the entire season. Yeah, so 23, Pamastika. I like this it's all right, um, but it kind of... Uh, you know, there's something actually about that. At the time this episode came out, The Last of Us was a thing. Like, that, that game was seriously new. And uh-huh. I think I've just been at it too. So I think I was in the mood for some, like, you know, a, vi- a, a kind of a zombie virus. In a, and that gave me that in the form of an ninja. Episode. Fair enough. You know what? Fair. I'll take it. 
Fair but, enough. Um, I wasn't too uh, into this so, one, I admit. Like, it, it's alright, there's nothing wrong with this episode. It's definitely better than the previous episode, but it kind of feels a little bit out of nowhere, considering what comes after it. It kind of just feels like a little bit of filler, in a way. Right? Yeah, it is filler, but at the same time, I the turtles only have them, themselves to walk off of, you know. It's implied that Splinter has taken April one to, uh, you know, to like, um, an assi- a, you know, a training assignment, mm-hmm. um, which you know is is kind of a lazy quick way to say this is why they're not here. But at the same time, I like it that you know there's no Shredder, there's no the Crank, there's no Splinter and April. It's just the turtles dealing with a with a thing that breaks them apart in a sense. Mm-hmm. I like that. I, I like that. You know, I like it, and I do like that. Being a Michelangelo fan, that it's Mikey that saves the day. Yeah. Fair enough. Like, actually, Mikey has a really good moment here, and everyone kind of acknowledges that. It's nice. Overall, like you know, like I said, it's a better episode than the previous episode, but it does feel a bit out of place, I think, and very much like filler, considering what comes after. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's not the best of filler, but it's a fun. Film. It works. Anyway, mm-hmm. episode 24, we are so close. Operation Breakout. Mm-hmm. Um, so Donatello <coughs> decides to go out and rescue April's father yeah, they get by a, himself. April gets a message from her father that he decrypts, and he decides to go out and rescue him to impress April. Mm-hmm. And Which actually you know, does pretty yeah. decently well, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he does well, but you know, uh, I, I do like uh, that. There's a point where Donnie names uh, the things uh, they're fighting the neutralizer, mm-hmm. and Mikey is actually bummed about it. Like, I you guess made something. The, big. It, this is supposed to be a reference to the Punisher, isn't it? Uh, if it is I mean you I'm can see sure like on his chest is like the Punisher skull like it has to be like a one big reference thing okay if it is then like I this is supposedly it. Dimension not... X's The Punisher I'm not familiar with The Punisher that much so I'll fair take enough. your word for it fair enough Um, does I'm guessing the neutralizer comes back later yeah you cut out I'm guessing the neutralizer comes back later yeah yeah, he, he's a, yeah, he is a recon villain. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, so but the episode does end with uh, the with the turtles rescuing April's father, known as Kirby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they and, end up rescuing uh, him. And but uh, it is uh, it is implied though that he's under the crank's control. Mm-hmm. So that's a thing to keep an eye out. Like for. we see that, you know, at the end of this episode, that this is, we see the Krang and Shredder are completely working together at the end of this episode, and that yeah. Kirby is Which supposedly sets up... a part of their plan. Mm-hmm. Which sets out, uh, sets up you know, <clears throat> the, the next episode, which is the season finale <clears throat> showdown. Mm-hmm. So uh, this finale is. Um, is half an F for me, you know the part and um, so the part with the turtles going to, you know, um, going into TCRI and then to the Technodrome, which is the Krang's um, spaceship. Mm-hmm. Um, that that part I think is okay. You know, it gets the job done. The, there are laughs. There are good fight scenes. There are, each turtle does do his part. Well, you see kind and, of you, you see know, Metalhead come back into play. You kind of see a lot of different stuff yeah. from previous episodes of the season mm-hmm. come back into play here and it's nice to see that yeah you see all of this and then you also kind of learn start to learn why the Krang is such an interest in April which is they find her compatible which is something that she... uh, will be played up. yeah I'm sure it'll go you, you'll get learn more about this in season two but she's like kind of the her her mind is like the thing that can help them reshape this world and the universe or this mm-hmm. dimension, like she's the most connected. She's the most connected person to this dimension. I yeah. don't know. Uh, yeah, but um, it, it will be explained there later. There is an explanation. We see um, Krang Prime the, in this episode as well. Yeah, Krang Prime as well. The main, the main leader of the Krang, uh, who talks perfect English, by the way. That's a thing. Krang Prime. That's her name. And uh, and also another thing. Actually, when the tunnels <clears> go up to rescue April. 
then the Crank Prime t- tells them Crank will not be defeated by a bunch of reptiles, and Michelangelo tells them at, le- at least we are not some stupid aliens. I I'm not sure about this, but I think that was a jab from the writers on the idea that Michael Bay wanted to turn the tellers into aliens in his ver- in his movie. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it's supposed to be. I'm not, but don't quote. I mean, even if it's not, let's just assume it is. Because yeah. it's not like the ten, it's not like the Michael Bay Ninja Turtle movies were all that good, anyways. <laughs> yeah, you're right. These movies suck. But um, yeah, but you know, the part with the turtles, you know, fighting the crank is, you know, it's serviceable. It it gets the job done. Leo gets his heroic little thing that you know everyone thinks he sacrifices himself, but he ends up being okay despite the technodrome drone being sent back to Dimension X. This again, this is another thing the eighties cartoon. Uh, but then we have the other part of the oh, Technotrom doesn't get sent back to Dimension X, it just falls into the ocean. Yeah, but you know, but it, at least Crank Prime is. is? But, um, no, I think all that's in the ocean. Crank Prime is also in the ocean too, and not sent back to Dimension X. No, no, no. Crank Prime specifically, I know, is back in Dimension X. Oh, are you sure? I must have missed that part. <clears throat> Either way, that's kind of the Either B way. plot. There's the more interesting part of this is Shredder versus Splinter. Splinter. So, um, in an attempt to lose Splinter, Shredder kidnaps. You know, Shredder kidnaps April in order to set aside the crime. Mm-hmm. But, um, but, uh, so, but he does set a trap for Splinter to come and rescue him, so that he could uh, take him up one on one, and. And you know, the, I do like that. You know, you see like a dog pound, you know, you see Bradford talking about this, uh, you know, what about Splinter. And as they talk about him, we see him like taking out all of the foot soldiers, mm-hmm. like without effort. And they say the only difference between these two is that he is not brave enough to go for the kill. Mm-hmm. And, and you kind of see that, you know, they are equal. They are, you know, they they do manage to give each other. Each one gives the other a run for. Yeah. And, and but the thing that uh, kind of, uh, but the thing that you know sends Splinter <clears throat> into a rage is the big plot twist, I, I, which I, I'm not sure. I'll ask you in a bit if you saw that coming or not. That Karai is actually Splinter's dog, mm-hmm. which Shredder kidnapped as, when she was a baby. When he burned, uh, when he killed uh, Splinter's wife, you know, he actually got out with uh, with uh, Splinter's daughter and actually raised her to to hate Splinter. Mm-hmm. So I, my question for you is: Did you see this coming? Yeah, I wasn't surprised by this. I knew they were going to do this. This one felt kind of obvious from the beginning, in my opinion. I thought they might we're going to try and do something with when, when April revealed that, you know, she didn't know her mother either. I thought they were going to try and keep up this idea of a mystery thing going on with, you know, April and Karai and are they related or stuff like that maybe. But w- when they revealed it, I'm like, Oh, okay. That's what, yeah. Okay. You're going that route. Fair enough. It's fine. I thought you might, we're going to hold on to this reveal for a bit longer, but fair enough. But yeah, I saw it coming. I'm not surprised. I wasn't surprised by it at all. Well, what uh, what I want to say about this is that I sounded to think in this direction once a Splinter told April that he had to be her age uh, at one point. Mm-hmm. At this point in time. So, and since they're both the same age, I said, hmm. Uh, but again, this is one of the things I like they did with the idea of making Splinter Hamato Yoshi. They could actually do that, yeah. that uh, Karai is actually his daughter. Yeah. Because, Ka- really because Karai wasn't in the... End. It helps for both yeah, characters. Because, yeah, because Karai wasn't in the 80s. Mm-hmm. So, with the help being in here and this idea, that, you know, they actually took the best route you could, in my opinion. I so, as a, plot, as a plot twist, it may not be the most surprising plot of the twist, but it works. And you really also well. see kind of Shredder make fun of, you know, Splinter for being turned into a rat as well, right? Like, it, it all works really well, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, that's another thing I like, that you know, what uh, makes Splinter win the fight, quote-unquote, 
is that um, you know he actually ge- gets into his rat form like he starts you know running around like a rat and everything mm-hmm. which gives him the edge like he, yeah he starts and acting for- more like a rat which is interesting i think and i wonder if they'll come back to that in terms of his character because for the most part you've kind of seen his character be against this right against turning it against you know his kind of rat form and believing that he's more human than mm-hmm. rat but here he kind of uses that rat of uh, you know, that they, rat likeness to win this fight they go back and forth like you can see he has a bit of rat characteristics in the future but okay interesting like a fear of like he has a fear of let's say this but um i'm interested to see uh, where they go with the, it then um you'll see it's, uh, but um, regarding this, uh, so yeah, I, I was I wasn't surprised, but the way they reveal it, the way that Splinter actually uh, is about to strike Shredder, and Karai stops, and he looks at her, and he says, "Miwa," like you can see the pain in his eyes yeah. when he realizes that he, this is his child, tra- grown and trained to hate, him. like say what you want. That's freaking psychotic on the Shredder's part. Mm-hmm. Again, it helps sell him as a villain, though, really, really well. And it helps sell this blood feud between these two really well as well. And I'll be interested to see kind of how the turtles play into this and when Tr- Splinter or when Splinter reveals like who Karai really is to the turtles, too, because he does keep that, you know, a secret from them for now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so um, overall, they do kind of seem to have closed their Krang plot um, in a way, like. You know, if the show ended here and uh, there would be no, uh, n- nothing else with a the crank, then I say it, I say it's a satisfying finish. Yeah. But if the show ended here without, with all, with all the Karai stuff, I would be pretty mad. Well, but I mean, thankfully, we, we definitely didn't. know for a fact though that the crank aren't gone for good because we do see at the end that the Technodrome is still working. It's just mm-hmm. underwater. Yeah, but at the same time, this is. Something as soon as they were told, they are uh, getting them. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, we. So this is how the show. The, se- the season ends like the turtles are turtles against the Krang. They, at the, they don't destroy it, but they at least power down the Technodrome. Um, TCRI is blown up, and Splinter find out that his daughter is alive and is grown to hide him by the Shredder. And this is April's how he's reunited with this, her father as well, and he's no longer mind controlled. April, yeah, April is reunited with her father. That's always good. And we are left to, to wonder when would we watch season two so we could talk about it. Mm-hmm. Never. We're done here. I hate the show. Well, it's clear, too. <laughs> no. Like I said before, like I think this is a good ending that leaves a little bit of questions unanswered, like, you know, what's going to happen between Splinter and Shredder and Karai, and what's the deal with April and the Krang and her apparent thing with being connected to the universe and mental abilities, and this is definitely a thing that this show created, is it not? Like, this is not something that's been in the past with other shows or the comics. No. Yeah, I didn't think so. No, this is a show. This is a show. Overall, like, you know, definitely top three favorite characters, Splinter, Karai, April, and Shredder is probably favorite villain. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. And I'm I'm interested to see where they go with a lot of stuff. Like, I like some of the changes that they've made. I'm interested in seeing what uh, you will think about Mm -hmm. just season. There are some plot points I want to be enough already. Mm -hmm. So get to it, get to it. No, I'm gonna make you wait. Yes, it's fun to make you wait. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, we'll definitely we'll come see. back to this for season two and the rest of the seasons as well, and watch the show. Like I said, I'm yeah. interested to see where they go. I like a lot of the changes they've made. I'm not a huge Turtles fan, so the changes they have made don't affect me personally. But I like, you know, that they've made April the same age as the Turtles, and she's this kind of badass kid. And I like Karai; she's you know a badass ninja. And, you know, I just splinters, you know, the fun father, also master. Like, again, they have a lot of good stuff going on here. None of it's perfect, sure. But this first season, I think, definitely is overall a good season with a lot of good potential moving forward. Well, then, 
With that said, that's all for this outcast. We mm-hmm. hope you enjoyed. What is your favorite episode of this season of TMNT 2012? Um, I, I'm actually very interested in hearing your thoughts. And what do you think of the rest of the seasons if you've seen them? Whatever your thoughts are, you can tell us in the comment section below on our Tumblr, which is now Backcast Team, on our Twitter, which is Backcast Team, and you can find um, actually that uh, that's relevant because much. I mean, you, so, you've been going in and out this entire time, so... <laughs> uh, they got some so of that just, okay so <laughs> Tum- Tumblr, Belkast team Twitter, Belkast with a capital B with that being said I was HC I've been Wolf and we'll talk to you all next time take bye bye